a high definition telescope the picture and image resolution is very much uh, better there are nowadays flexible telescopes coming uh, in the market uh, which uh, also are good but little bit expensive than the routine uh, so rigid scopes this you can have or not have if you are a single surgeon definitely this is a uh, helps you in uh, uh, doing a major cases with uh, has uh, less of uh, trouble this is a uh, scope holder which you can attach to your table and be free and assistant can also watch on the monitor and you can operate these are the long instruments you should have one basic thing is the right angle forceps which is a very important forceps uh, rest all instruments you can use long instruments from a open set so uh, always always you should have vascular clamps stand by in case any difficult anatomy or you are at the initial part of your career there will be vessel injuries there will be some uh, mishaps ha happening so your tray should be ready a long instrument set has to be there this is very uh, important when troubleshooting any problem this thing and one sponge on stick should be ready always uh, on the table in case any bleeding injury just grab the sponge on stick and apply on the vessel uh, and routine laparoscopy instruments definitely they help you should have blunt tip trocar i still remember incident in uh, 2005 when we used to have the sharp trocars and we had put the trocar and it has it had gone into the spleen we had to do additional splenectomy for that from that on day onwards we do ports by open method and use this blunt tip trocar so thoracotomy set or sternotomy set has to be ready within the operation theater and checked. The sternotomy saw should be checked and for fully working when you are at, uh, contemplating any mediastinal tumor excision or a uh, thymectomy uh, excision. And these are the optional uh, options you can have your endo bag or you can make a custom uh, uro bag uh, made of uh, string suture. Uh, a, uh, uh, specimen retrieval bag. So, what are the energy devices we, you should have? This is a uh, ultrasonic scalpel, uh, which uh, uh, with a long handle, especially with with a uh, the smooth uh, tip, which is definitely useful for uh, dissecting. Have high precision, which has got less lateral damage and uh, no lateral current. Another uh, examples are from different companies. The Thunderbeat is there from Olympus, and uh, one of the loved, uh, recently loved uh, across the international scenario is the uh, Maryland Ligasure, which uh, which uh, has additional uh, uh, advantage of clamping and then cutting and coagulating. So these are the. Uh, uh, the specifications what you can uh, vessel sealing properties of uh, harmonic scalpel is 5 mm ligature is 7 mm and the thunderbeat is also 7 mm rest you can have these are all available online so what are the other cheaper options so if your ligature doesn't work if your harmonic doesn't work uh, it's not that you should open you have monopolar hook with a long handle you uh, uh, it, it is available in the market so that is like a basic thing you should have but it requires uh, it is a good ex it is an excellent dissection tool uh, it has good precision but the skill level required is high a lot of smoke and uh, fog production is there which uh, obscures your field and frequent camera cleaning is required and even the lateral thermal injury and fire sparks are there uh, needs frequent tip cleaning even you can use your uh, laparoscopy scissors attach cautery to it and dissect uh, uh, even in the thorax Although nowadays a lot of people have started using this laparoscopic bipolar forceps for fissure dissection and uh, the making the, the pure cuts but again the drawback is uh, smoke production repeated cleaning of camera tip and repeated cleaning of forceps tip it is it has the ability of 2 to 3 mm sealing of 2 to 3 mm vessels all the people claim that the 5 to 7 mm vessels can be sealed with this instrument so another uh, one thing which has revolutionized vats is our endoscopic staplers so you have to choose your cartridge properly those are uh, doing uniportal vats or triportal bipotal we require in thorax the articulating uh, staplers 
so generally for uh, simplified use these are tri staple technology with uh, variable size or variable compression of uh, staple uh, heights the generally the simple dictum is the pan or the white are for the vessels uh, the purple uh, or the black purple is generally for the bronchus and uh, the fissure also and if you are uh, doing carinal resections especially thick tissue is there or the thick lung is there then the black staples are used so this is a, a example of a gun uh, which has uh, got a articulating uh, knob here uh, you can have always a hands on in any wax workshop so these are the specifications uh, of the tan purple and the black uh, this thing these are closed tissue thickness uh, height is there that is 1.8 mm for the tan 1.5 to 2.25 for the uh, mm for the purple 2.25 to 3 mm for the uh, black one so these are the reloads the meditronic reloads are available is it 30 mm generally for the bronchus and the vessels i use uh, 30 mm uh, if 30 mm is not available then the 45 mm is will do and the general the fissure you require the 60 mm because we always with one single wire you can take care of a long distance of uh, fissure so these are the powered guns also available where uh, you uh, it has got a sensing technology about uh, tissue thickness and auto fire so another thing we are one uh, wax surgeon should uh, remember that they should not forget their open surgical skills definitely the same open surgical skills can be used in wax suturing inside so anesthesia equipment definitely anesthesia anesthetics is the major part of our team double lumen uh, tube for, for lung insulation endobronchial ventilation and uh, total intravenous anesthesia single lumen tube also can be used and uh, nowadays uh, more and more Awake wax have been done and non-intubated wax are being done. This is the right and left side DLT. Left sided DLT is more often used. So uh, pediatric or intubating bronchoscope should be there within your uh, department. What are the chest drain systems available? So you uh, can have all these options available. Uh, this is a routine uh, ICD bag which is a cheap and easily available uh, this thing but when you want something for air leaks uh, this blue river device helps where you can quantify the air leaks as per the Robert Serfolio grading and classification the digital suction uh, devices are available uh, the, uh, or from various companies which can show the intrapleural pressure as well as the set pressure and the leakage amount so patient positioning, very important is patient positioning before uh, starting the wax. It will create a hell or it will make your job easy. It depends on what type of approach you uh, want for wax. So this is for a wax esophagectomy prone position, board positions, pediatric wax. This extra care has to be taken for obese patient. They should not fall from the uh, operation theater table. Special care for the arm left arm the operating side arm which you are uh, operating uh, the bolster can be kept to widen the intercostal space the, the arm has to be taken care of proper gel pads the pressure points have to be uh, taken care of the uh, body part should not touch any metal metal uh, parts uh, the pillow should be kept in between the two uh, legs and in proper strapping and proper supports back support and anterior support you can bend the table if you don't have a bolster this is a typical position of wax left uh, lung section the final position after painting and dripping this is a prone position for thoracic esophagectomy so tips and tricks facilitate widening of intercostal spaces the operative hand should not uh, uh, operative side hand should not restrict your camera movements especially while performing uniportal wax case of in case of emergency thoracotomy uh, it should be easy space for manipulation of endotracheal tube for the anesthetist protecting the pressure points preventing undue stretch pressure on the arms preventing brachial plexus injury care of the spine patient should not fall during table tilt and surgery proper strapping has to be there now the working arena this is a typical uh, working arena with two monitors and uh, uh, wax setup definitely your team is very important in this everybody has a specific role so always keep your CT scan films and X-ray in your vision. 
if you find any difficulty you can always revisit there and there has to uh, your eye has to be in the line of the monitor monitor for the assistant should be there otherwise your assistant will get bored so the, this is how you operate uniportal watch this is the shanghai style where the monitor is kept at the anesthetist side head end this is the configuration for operating from behind of the patient and this is operating from in front of the patient you can see the various for the upper lobe you keep the monitor little bit head inwards for lower lobe uh, exactly in front of you and this is the shanghai style where the monitor uh, is kept at the head end of the patient so working arena tips is definitely monitor at eye level diagnostic wax first always monitor for the assistant involve your junior colleagues in teaching and discussion get their inputs as well that keeps them interested during the whole procedure sometimes you have eureka moments especially in difficult wax difficult to proceed you know your junior gives a simple advice and that changes the whole plan keep engaging your anesthetist especially when you are doing awake wax non intubated wax or difficult to proceed cases watch to always uh, discuss your anatomy with your colleagues or the radiologist see this is a azygous lobe where uh, you have to uh, see when contemplating right upper lobectomy caution always open and control before it's late in wax do not proceed uh, if you still see bleeding and it's you are proceeding with with and you will lose the patient outcome matters patient sees only scar and uh, his well being these are uh, newer technologies coming up uh, newer anesthetist techniques so you can do more of tubeless non intubated subsified uniportal wax so basic wax can be attempted first diagnostic wax pleural biopsy wedge biopsy of lung pleural disease bullectomy pericardial window diaphragmatic evacuation repair and training and improvisation definitely attending workshop conferences learning from colleagues learning from colleagues mistakes editing your own videos sharing your experience presentations in conferences publications teaching and encouraging your juniors then definitely as you teach and encourage you will achieve higher skills and progress Uh, definitely uh, uh, entertainer has to be there in your department which uh, helps uh, in uh, increasing your skills also endo suturing cutting whatever the other important team players anesthetist pulmonologist critical expert and physiotherapist so uh, before taking uh, patient to theater always discuss with your anesthesia team and the or team about the approach plan of action troubleshoot plan keep always open and vascular set ready check your equipment keep all suture material and equipment ready check your recorder go through your checklist doing wax is a skill it improves with numbers careful observation and simulation in mind whatever you do do it safely this is should be appropriately treated without compromising on surgical principles all it matters is a living patient and being treated safely good luck and blessings definitely count thank you so detail yeah. yeah. it's a detailed description dr bhushan yeah yeah so uh, there any questions uh, what has been your experience with different energy devices that you showed or that those are available there are quite a few cheaper ones which are available from uh, china e yes they uh, see i will tell you i have done wads with hook and uh, scissors also so as i mentioned lot of lateral injury and smoke is there uh different this thing but uh, you have added advantage and the speed of uh, surgery increases with ligature sure devices and the uh, harmonic devices where the lateral energy dissipation is less because what happens with the hook cautery and scissors if you start in early part of career especially when i am teaching my junior colleagues i keep uh, i uh, uh, tell them that you use ligature sure. even i am at peace they won't touch any aorta or they won't touch any major vessel and just burn it off with ligature sure, you have to grab it it will take time to coagulate and then your hand you with your hand you will be cutting the uh, this thing is uh, anatomical part that is 
so cheaper uh, alternatives are available as long as you should uh, simulate uh, uh, what skill level you are working if you are a simple surgeon sta just starting the journey of labs i would recommend bipolar devices are the cheaper uh, devices uh, which can be used as shown in the uh, presentation it hardly costs something around uh, 5 to 10000 rupees and the routine generator is used even the fissure dissection even the pleural cuts will be taken very easily and it has got a smooth taper tip also same thing even with stapler yeah yeah definitely nowadays other company staplers are also available those are also good enough yes yes i used all of them variety of them it is just a matter of comfort which setup you are uh, operating and what level of uh, expertise you want. Yeah. Yeah, please, doctor. Thank you very much for your great presentation. Huh. Yes, it's important. I, I find the uh, harmonic shears more adequate to do the uh, part to report about the section that the, the ACE. Naturally, you have the same impression. Yes, yes, definitely the uh, harmonic is better, faster and high precision and especially that uh, ethicon harmonic it has a smooth tip so you don't inadvertently injure any vessel with that the near uh, thunder uh, harmonic which is a pointed tip that is very dangerous yes no. the, the shears is a little bit sharp Shh. and allow you to grasp the tissue and they set the tissue faster than the ac it yeah don't as you yes, yes, the impression yeah, I have used that, but uh, it was like a little bit fear. <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bhushan. Yeah, same, 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 same. Same, same, same bipolar. A lot of, uh, it is a 5 to 10,000 rupees. It is available on Amazon also. <laughs> Thank you so much, sir. I request Dr. Abhichi Tateshwar, sir, HOD ESIC Medical College, Hyderabad, to please seat the chair. Coming to our next topic, Port Planning Basic Watch Procedure by Dr. Bala, sir. Morning, everybody. Uh, so uh, I'll be discussing about uh, port planning and uh, all the basic device procedures. So uh, just a few words about, about our patient positioning. So uh, as far as VAS is concerned, I feel that definitely the most important thing we have to uh, focus upon is patient positioning. If your patient positioning is bad, you, you are going to struggle through the, the whole, whole procedure. So, so here we see it's the normal uh, added decubitus position we have in the orchotomies, but we see that the table is broken here and it, it's flexed. So it's particularly important, especially in uh, women who are a bit uh, bulky and have adequate hips. If you don't have that flexion there, your cam camera movements are throughout the case it is going to be ha hampered by the hip. So your camera movement will keep hitting the hip. So it's pretty important that when you position the patient, your hips are lower, 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 lower down, and you have space for free movement of the camera here. So now going on to a small video where, uh, um, yeah, where we plan up ports. So you can see the posterior axial line here, last rib in the intercostal margin at that line will be the tenth rib. And so you're feeling the scapula there, tip of the scapula, you're feeling the the axillary folds representing the, the, L, the trapezius and the LD there. 
uh, and you're feeling the last rib in that posterior axial line, and the as you and the rib, you, you you can count upwards from uh, 10, 9, 8, and 7. So normally, uh, when we do a lower lobe, we go in through through the eight space. If we are go do do doing the upper lobe, we go one space higher. And then we see the you know the anterior working part here. You usually it's in the sixth space or, or in the fifth space. Your uh, your utility will will be somewhere in the fourth space or in the third space. So one space up or down depending on what lobe you're doing. So the fourth. What here is optional when I used to you know do earlier as pro pro procedures I used to use that posterior port for attraction but, but, but now we either do three port or, or even a two port and if it's a simple procedure like a epical bolectomy we can do through uniportal too so when you when you when you start a career is better to have four ports there, the NU slow always start coming down on your ports uh, as you be become more pro efficient in VAS. So now I'll be going on to uh, some, some of the basic procedures. So so like we all know, lobectomy is our final aim. We all want, want to do a vast lobectomy in the end, but uh, until we reach there, we have a number of other procedures which we can use to train. Like we have a level one procedures to level five procedures. We, we can start off with level one procedures which are di diagnostic biopsies. We have a lot of lymph node wedge biopsy. Level two are bullectomy, decortigenic sympathectomies. Then we go on to mediastinal tumor and the thymectomy uh, where we have handled the, the thymic veins here. And then we go on to level four, where we do 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 lobectomies, where we are handling major vascular structures like the pulmonary artery and the pulmonary vein. And, and level level five is the sleeve sleeve lo lobectomies, which are uh, pre pre higher higher end vascular pr procedures. So, so uh, adding a bit the diagnostic biopsy, we see a lot of patients who, who require pleural lung lymph node biopsies for numerous conditions like uh, advanced malignancy, lung, thyroid, metastasis, two close psychosis, or other. Now, now with the, the pulmonologist too uh, entering into the field of medical thoracoscopy, our chance of doing a biopsy is pretty low, but, but we, we, we still have situations li li like that. Uh, there is a, a 54 year old man who uh, for, for following a PTC started showing occasional behavioral alterations. He was having person hypernatremia, uh, suspected paraneoplastic syndrome uh, and uh, the uh, CET showed something like that. The pet showed diffuse FDG avid mediastinal lymph nodes there uh, and he also had a non-FDG avid no nodule in the lung. Uh, a prominent left hilar lymph node and uh, the adipose were what we saw in society. So basically we can use a finger to palpate that lung nodule and we are doing a biopsy of that nodule and surprisingly it came, came as a small cell carcinoma uh, and it was diagnosed as paraneoplastic syndrome. So another similar situation where we had an opportunity to do a biopsy, a 60-year-old lady hypertensive present with skin itching and cuff. And cuff. You can see a large uh, parenchymal mass there, uh, and uh, she, she was uh, suspected to have a malignancy. They were not sure what's a malignancy. All the CT guide FNACs were negative, so we 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 had to go in and do a. a Perhaps so you can see a uh, in a pretty FDG avid mediastinal fat 
re region there so you can see the middle lobe show, show in tumor and you can see some metastatic deposits there or, or the pericardial fat so uh, we went there and did that to took that by IFC from on that fat and also from the lung Uh, and she uh, ultimately turned out to, to be a B cell lymphoma. So that's another case of the arterial uh, oral house wife who had uh, <laughs> Disney on accession for around two years, exacerbated uh, since a month. Uh, she has a history of uh, homeo treatment for joint arthritis, and the HRCT was showing a, lo a lot of irregular pleural thickening. You can see facial th thickening there. And uh, she uh, underwent a bad for biopsy, but it did dramatic picture showing ru 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 rheumatoid nodules, uh, all are real hard and uh, you know, concrete like. And uh, it was uh, she uh, underwent a oral biopsy to prove that she, it was uh, all rheumatoid nodules, and she uh, underwent st steroid therapy and improved on st steroid therapy and immunosuppression. Is uh, and this it will be patient uh, for a 2 year old lady who who ha had unexplained blue oral effusion. You can you can see his ma massive blue effusion, a co collapsed lung uh, in in in, uh, in some others. Uh, and she was tagged with, without actually diagnosing what was the re reason for the malignant blue effusion. And uh, as a but see, it, you can clearly see her uh, right uh, lung lesion there. Uh, it's some pleural <laughs> thickening, and the, that's what we saw in inside. Uh, Post-talc pleural disease here, so you can see all that uh, for our embodied reaction in the in the in the pleural and over, over the lung. So, so we took a pleural biopsy to diagnose what she was having. And, uh, the, and and we went on to do a decortication, and uh, she she came out to be a moderately differentiated uh, adenocarcinoma. So post talc, the 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 peel was like really hard. So so you can see me using the blade over, over the lung, and and to get some so out of a plane. But uh, as you can see. Post decortication, you can see a normal under, underlying lung. Of course, the right uh, lower lobe was having a CA lung, adenoca carcinoma, but the remaining lung pretty much expanded back up. So going on to some um, other basic procedures that I'd be do. There's a 66 year old man who had a CA, CAB, CABG and a left carotid endectomy done. And after three, three, three months, the echo showed that he, he was having a pericardial effusion, uh, mostly pericardial effusion positive to the LV. And uh, that's uh, the situation we see in probably You can see after the, the, the CABG, you can see that the whole lung has stuck to the pericardium. So, so slowly, slowly we release the additions of the lung from the pericardium. We release the whole uh, pericardium, the, you know, the inferior part of almond ligament so, so, so that we are able to really mo mobilize the lung. And, and, and see, mobilize the lung uh, adequately. Uh, yeah, the, that's the pulmonary ligament be, being released. So when, once the, you know, the, the lungs are fully mobilized, you put a posterior port over there. You take the metal and grab your pericardium. It's easy to grab the pericardium if you have sufficient amount of flu fluid in, inside. And uh, once you drain all the fluid out, you go on to uh, do a pericardial in endo, so you don't have a recurrent flow or 
fusion. So you, you, can, you can do, do the same thing in case of malignant blue light fusion too. Then these are all easy procedures which we, can, which we can do at the start of our career. Uh, I'm a hyper uh, hydrostress. The, the, that's only uh, a role you can see all this shiny hands uh, because of the increased uh, sweating. So here you go and uh, you know you start uh, go you go on one lung. You use two ports. You can even do 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 it on a single port. You go and start counting your ribs. From from one, two, three, four, and then you 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 isolate the uh, the, the sympathetic nerve from the T2 to T4 level, and uh, to take care of the you know excise the uh, the sympathetic, sympathetic triangle from T2 to T4. Here the ribs are being marked and entering into the mediastinal pleura making a vertical cut, identifying your sympathetic trunk. All base we do histology, histopathological confirmation of the uh, nerve we removed, we absolutely sure that we have removed the nerve uh, and we do, do the procedure bilaterally. So the, the objective evidence that your, uh, your uh, impathectomy is complete, you can see that the temperature here, we, 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 play, we place a temperature probe over the palm of the side we are operating and you can see the temperature is around 29.6 pre-sympathectomy and immediately after sympathectomy in, in around 5 to 10 minutes, you can see that the temperature is up. So it's an objective evidence that your, your sympathectomy is over. Uh, picked as a excavated to repair 11 year old boy uh, with a severe chest deformity uh, and uh, the, the role of bats here would be to visualize uh, how your your, your uh, Im implant is coming a retroster only so a small uh, you know small fear we all have when we are putting that implant in blindly is whether you are going to go into the heart so so here basically the role of vats is to put a IOM camera on the right side yeah and and uh, see that you you are implant this uh, you know, say if we entering there retrosternally. And uh, the, the, that's an interesting uh, case here. Uh, it's a peri aortic graft uh, abscess which we evacuated on, on by, by, basically it was a 28 year old male policeman who had a postural thoracotomy for a thoracic aortic replacement. For, uh, who, who, who had a thoracic aortic replacement with a Dacron graft and a transital uh, esophagotomy. He had an aortic and esophageal perforation because of a fish bone. So we had to do that procedure. But uh, after a week, he started developing spiking fever. And uh, we did, uh, you know, uh, a CTA a a aortograms. So if you call, Concentrate on to the area of the aorta here. You can, you can see that he has a collection area aortic here around the graft. And we went then to uh, do a batch here. So he, 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 he all, uh, all already had a thought me previously. So you can see a bit of additions there. You can see all the necrotic material uh, around the aortic graft.
Yeah, the LCR uh, graph, graph coming into view there. This is the another person who is a patient who is a very dear patient with the history of all year in the aortic rupture. He was managed with the aortic and the aortic rupture. But post procedure, he was supposed to be, he was not to have any elevated, elevated left dive from there. So, uh, so we had to do a uh, you know, a, a, a inspection just to be sure he, he does not have a rupture in, in his diaphragm. So, uh, what we found, found that he was not having a rupture, he, he was having an eventration. And the adhe adhe adhesions to all the diaphragm are being released and uh, And, and you can see it's even tension. You can see that the diaphragm is a really lax. And we go ahead and apply the atom bands. So, so wheelchairing on on bats is a bit more tougher and compared to robotics, but. but uh, it also does the job. So, yeah, so, so you can see here that the area is well, well placated. So, the SSL, I'd show owing our journey as the RAC 6 surgeons from predominantly open thoracotomies to our, uh, you know, ma ma muscle sparing thoracotomies to ads and now onto robotics. Thank you. So that's a uh, yeah, very rare situation. case uh, I did it pretty early in my, in my career. So now I, I put the camera way up here. So so uh, I'll have a better view of the diaphragm. Here I have it pretty low. And once you start there, either you can go ahead with that if you're comfortable or you can rotate your camera and camera up here. Yeah, yeah. No, it's pretty early in my idea, so <laughs> may, 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 may not be operating the same way now. Can we use a stapler for the event rated diaphragm? Uh, that's not recommended. Because when and we do a stapling, see the, the diaphragm is pretty friable, so so it can tear, and you are devascularizing the, the whole area. So so you you can't be really sure whether it will hold long term. So I would uh, prefer to use heavy pro oil in, and number one or number number two, rather than you use uh, four or or Two. So they you usually be they it will be very obese individuals. So so we 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 also see how high the BMI is. If the BMI is really high, we are ask them to go go back do do some weight reduction and then and then come back. So be, because if we do a really obese man and if you use a th thin suture, uh, they tend to to snap. So uh, heavy sutures. Uh, I have no experience with stapling, uh, and I, I don't feel it's recommended to. Uh, I like to. Yeah. The diaphragm is already thinned out. That's the reason for the inventation. If you staple it, the sutures don't hold, and I have seen plenty of recurrences after the staping thing. If you plicate it, it gives a reinforcement to the diaphragm. Uh, any uh, uh, difference in uh, the outcome through lap and VATS in uh, diaphragmatic plication? In my own practice, I have seen at least three patients who underwent uh, lap 
application and then they came back. Any any difference? Any experience? Both lab and uh, VATS also. So there's not much difference. No. If you are a good lab surgeon, you are prepared for all that one will be very fantastic. Now, if you are a good VATS surgeon, you can do uh, by VATS also. Just the concept is uh, the diaphragm is thinned out to a uh, umbrication technique so that whole uh, diaphragm is bring like a curtain uh, inside and it strengthens and buttresses the whole diaphragm. Makes it a bulk so that in future the recurrences are less. So, unless you, you, you have a lot of uh, intra abdominal contents urinating, uh, I think it will, it will be easier to see and repair from the chest there and from the abdomen. So, if you have a lot of colon or spleen and all that urinating way up. Uh, the, unless you have a situation like that, I think it's easy to see and repair from the chest than the, 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 from the abdomen. From the ab 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 No, we, 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 we actually hold the diaphragm di up and then take a suture. So, so we, it's not, not, not like the diaphragm is like flat and we are taking a suture. We hold it up. So once we take an initial bite, we use that traction to hold it up. So we are sure we are not taking any underlying structure. So on the on the right side you will have liver on the underlying. On the left side we are always may make sure the right should be thin. It's well aspirated. So 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 so, so the stomach can be strong and you slightly hold the die from up, upwards and you take your switches. Uh, we are uh, use number two pro olin here. Number two pro olin. Uh, although uh, a thin bond heavy vehicle, all, all the, those can, can be used. Pro olin slides easily. So so uh, I, I find that when we do a pro-ication, using pro olin is e e easier. Any more uh, questions? Uh, Dr. Bala, masterly a spectrum of cases by a master surgeon, but I am sure there's quite a few of spectra, uh, the level 1, level 2 cases I am sure now must have been taken over by Department of Pulmonology. Uh, I don't think most of the newer surgeons will be lucky enough to get <laughs> the cases from level 1, level 2, especially those biopsies, diagnostic uh, thoracoscopy and all. Yeah. Right. Do you find that uh, happening now? Quite so uh, yeah, so common uh, oral biopsies have become uncommon, yeah. and uh, lymph node biopsies, which were uncommon earlier, it's become rare. So <laughs> okay, thank you so much, so much for your patience here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. For our next topic, wax decortication and wax thymectomy by Dr. Manjunath Bale, sir.
Good morning, everyone. So, uh, in uh, case of thymus, when is the surgeon in involved? Uh, it's uh, for early onset myasthenia gravis with or without thymoma. Okay, we should be very cautious when operating earlier in the earlier the career because we have to. We should not do cases like uh, mass positive myasthenia gravis and oc pure ocular myasthenia because the results are very poor. And what happens is once you do see such cases, the neurologists get discouraged and they stop sending you cases because they'll say the, re the results are not great. So you should be very case, uh, careful in that condition. Once there's a thymic tumor, you don't have much option. You have to do a thymectomy. If there's a thymoma or a thymic carcinoma or a thymic cyst, all these conditions, you, the surgeon is already involved. The other conditions which rarely present to us, especially when I was in AIMS, we used to get such cases like eptopic parathyroid adenomas, pure red cell aplasia where there's a thymic hyperplasia and you're operating. Very rarely patients have some chest pain and vague discomfort in the chest and they diagnose to have sympathetic, uh, symptomatic uh, enlargement of the thymus. This is a very rare scenario. It's only in the textbooks. I've never seen such case. So uh, th those are the conditions where uh, thymectomy is offered to a patient. The contraindications are generally advanced stage uh, thymomas, poorly controlled myasthenia. In, in, in myasthenia, the role of uh, the neurologist and a close uh, association with the neurologist and the critical care is very important because you don't want to uh, operate on a poorly controlled myasthenic patient because you'll have a very uh, difficult post-op course. And uh, especially if there's a t uh, tumor involved uh, very close to the phrenic, the complications are a little more. So you should be very careful. Normally, the thymus varies with si size. When the when we are when we are in the early in the uh, preschool age, the thymus size is large. With uh, teenagers, the size shrinks. And further, uh, with age, it almost it's completely replaced by fat. So the immunological function also comes down with uh, age. So this is an example of uh, thymic hyperplasia. We can see that uh, the it's uh, when when beyond the teenage, if the gland is seen, that means it's the hyperplasia. It's seen in about 65% of uh, myasthenia gravis patients. It's generally symmetrical. If it's asymmetrical, then you have to think of a thymoma. And CT generally, what they report is is a normal appearing thymus, and there is nothing else. Occasionally, you can see some fo focal nodules. An MR is better uh, to rule out a thymoma in most of the conditions. This is a uh, thymoma. This is a needle biopsy which is done through it. Uh, and you can see about in about uh, 10 to 40 percent of cases, you can see some calcifications also. This is another example of a thymoma, an invasive one. This is thymoma with pleural deposits. We have uh, uh, cases where they come with um, uh, metastatic lesions. This is a very rare case of thymolymphoma. This this X -ray, this CT is taken from Ames. We were working earlier. Uh, this is a large thymic carcinoid, uh, uh, very huge one, uh, and this is again uh, this also this uh, this image is also from Ames. Uh, so this was an ectopic parathyroid with patient uh, who had who has been who had treated everywhere else with uh, various uh, orthopedicians for kyphoscoliosis, and then finally they she landed up with the uh, endocrinologist who detected it to have a parathyroid adenoma. So there are three, there are mainly, uh, broadly there are three thymectomy uh, variations in the techniques. One is a basic thymectomy, an extended thymectomy and a thymomectomy. So there is always a controversy what is good and what is not good. But the recent uh, NEGM article almost settles the issue that you should do an extended thymectomy for myasthenia gravis. For thymic, for uh, uh, even for uh, uh, early stage um, uh, thymomas, there is still the debate is on whether you should do a thymectomy or a thymomectomy. But if given a choice, better do a thymectomy and uh, uh, give a complete uh, relief to the patient. Uh, the, in the basic thymectomy, you remove the thymus gland uh, in total. The uh, phrenic to phrenic is removed, but rest is not done. Uh, the idea behind extended thymectomy is you'll have ectopic uh, thymic tissue, not only between uh, the, in the fat between the phrenic to phrenic, but also in the parietic groove and uh, above the subclavian, uh, above the uh, innominate vein. So, and uh, we, when we take down the horns, you should not see any structures other than the vein and the trachea. So, that is extended thymectomy. You, you remove all the tissue between, uh, from the pericardium, the brachycephalic vein and the thymus. So, in thymomectomy, you just remove the thymus alone. Uh, some, uh, there is a strong uh, proponents of uh, that also. And uh, there are, there are re recent studies that uh, patients are developing uh, uh, leukemias after uh, thymo thymectomy compared to thymomectomy. It's a, it's a single article which was published, uh, I think, two years back. 
So when we talk of thymectomy, uh, generally uh, the right cavity is preferred because we have uh, uh, enough space for your ports and instrumentation. And uh, the main thing which decides whether you want to do a right or left is your preoperative imaging. For example, uh, in this case, the tumor is on the left side. So uh, you, it would be better if you approach from the left side because your heart will, uh, your uh, vision, if, you, if you're operating from the right side, the vision will be obscured and you might go into the uh, tumor here. So it's better to start from the left side. And uh, generally right is preferred over left because of the access and uh, the, on the left side your heart will be always uh, coming in between so it will make your life a little difficult. Bilateral thymectomy is also a good option especially if you are not sure of the clearance of the phrenic and the, uh, where the phrenic is it is always better to put a scope on the opposite side and see. So this is the port positioning. I will tell you a few important things about post port positioning. So a, any anti-metastinal uh, structures you want to place, the, the camera should be either in the anti axillary line or maximum in between the anterior and mid axillary line. Generally a fifth intercostal space is preferred. Then the other two ports, this port, this is a 5 mm port, this should be in the di line of the innominate vein. If you place it below then your, uh, the dissection at the innominate vein becomes very difficult if you place it little above or little below. So you should, once you place this camera port, try to see where the vein is and then just try to angulate, uh, put, uh, place the trocar in the same direction. The lower, the, this in, this uh, uh, this can be variable. You have, you can place it a little anteriorly also or just in the uh, anterior axillary line. If you place it little anteriorly, your, the movement is little more, that's what I've noticed in recent times. The, just you place it little, uh, almost in the mid clavicular line so that it becomes easy for you to manipulate. So the positioning is uh, very uh, similar to what Dr. Bhushan had showed yesterday. The hand is uh, strapped uh, below. Sometimes we keep the hand elevated and fix it with the rod. That, that, that is also uh, useful. Uh, but in robotic you can't do it because the, the arms of the robot will come in uh, on your way. So you should try and place the arms like this. Try to bring the patient as much as to the edge of the uh, table so that your, uh, your uh, instruments are not hitting the table at any point. This, uh, this arm should be placed such that your, uh, right, the, uh, the topmost uh, trocar doesn't hit your chest. So this is like another image, just uh, the tr uh, port placement. So this is the view which we see inside. So this is the internal mammary vein, uh, vein. This is the SVC. This is the thymus gland here. This is the right phrenic, the azygos, the sympathetic train and the right lung. Similarly, a very similar picture here. So uh, once you see this, so this is the right approach and this is the left approach, a very similar si uh, picture on the left side, the left phrenic, vagus, subclavian and the arch and the sympathetic train and this is the lymph node uh, with the just at the uh, internal mammary vein. So I will show you two approaches, one is the left approach and the right approach, this is the left approach. So this is a, tu a tumor in the left, uh, uh, left side of the gland, so we can see that uh, the whole of uh, 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 gland is visualized. The, uh, this is the phrenic here. This is the, vag the vagus. We start dissection at the uh, just anterior to the vagus. You can see some lymph nodes also here. So you should be very careful not to injure the phrenic because if, especially if the patient is myasthenic, you will have a very hard time in the post-op period. So we start with the uh, division of the pleura around the, along the phrenic nerve. So uh, this is uh, this is this is the proximal dissection. You go near the internal mammary vein. You use a hook or a harmonic in this place. Try, try to create the plane using CO2. As uh, Dr. Ali always used to tell us, use CO2 so that you once you make this. Uh, puncture into the pleura, you, the spaces are created much better. You can see that opposite lung is seen here. Uh, you, you need not worry much even if you open the pleura. Uh, you just tell the anesthetist to take care of the uh, pressures, uh, uh, just to have a closed monitor of the pressures. You need not really worry if the pleura is open also. So you can see there are large lymph nodes and uh, you can see this is the internal mammary vein here. So you tar, uh, start dissecting from the bed of the uh, tumor. This is the pericardium and you're just uh, dissecting it off the pericardium. This 
the main uh, part of the dissection in a thymus is along the brachycephalic vein which is uh, uh, which is the structure we should identify properly and see the thymic veins and uh, secure them properly so that's the brachycephalic vein uh, you can start seeing it now so these are the thymic horns uh, generally we we have to take the thymic horns in all the cases of myasthenia gravis uh, and uh, any uh, any uh, thymectomy you perform see this is the left thymic horn you should see the th uh, thymic horn at the th uh, with attachment with the thyrothymic ligament and then divide it from there and behind that you will have the trachea this is the whole brachycephalic vein which is seen underneath it uh, gentle strokes of uh, blunt dissection itself will uh, give you a good uh, uh, de delivering of the thymic horn you can use the harmonic and sometimes you can just clip it so that you are not worried about the bleeding at that place because it's a little difficult to even secure a small bleed there then you can see the thymic veins Uh, uh, there was uh, we all now I almost uh, use uh, exclusively hemolox. Initially we used to use clips, but we have seen uh, one or two instances where the clip comes off when you're doing suction. So you should be very careful with the clip with the titanium clips. Be secure to use a uh, hemolox. And then uh, this is the uh, right horn uh, from the uh, see that's the thyrotomic vein. So you completely take the thymus of the pericardium now and uh, one of the problem with the unilateral approach is uh, the uh, vision of visual, visualization of the uh, opposite phrenic is always a challenge uh, and uh, sometimes when you are going through this plane you don't know like unless you keep flipping and seeing you might injure the phrenic. The, the phrenic nerve is here just behind it but that's always a risk you have. So we should be very careful when you are doing this part of the dissection or actually you can, what you can do is you can pull the gla uh, whole gland towards it and dissect from the lateral to medial. So this is the left approach. So this is a right approach. Uh, can you check why the video is not playing? Unfortunately, the video is not. So, uh, this is a subsified view. Uh, sorry, if the right side video is not playing for some reason. So, this is a subsified view when we do a extended thymectomy. So, you can see the pericardium is completely uh, bared out. You can see the brachycephalic nicely. You can see the trachea here, and both the phrenics uh, are visualized. Uh, this view uh, is what you should achieve whether you, whether you achieve by bats or open or robotic immaterial but then this is the view we should achieve in a case of myasthenia with thymoma or with or without thymoma so this is the specimen uh, generally we place it on a on a on a board and we take uh, photos like this this is another video uh, this is the thymoma here so uh, so this is a different scenario where uh, you have the pericardial involvement. So this is a subsified approach. This was uh, this is Dr. Rajendra's video uh, when I was with him. This is his surgery. He, he had done this. Uh, subsified approach gives us a good access especially to the uh, visualization of the phrenic nerves and a situation where the lung is involved and all it makes us it makes life easy because uh, we can use the stapler easily if, uh, with that view so you can see that the once the uh, the, the involved part is uh, 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 stapled you can see that the thym thymus is there. Uh, this is he, this is the dissection at the phrenic nerve. It's very close to the phrenic nerve.
one has to be very careful uh, with the phrenic nerve in, in case of any thymectomy. So this is a large uh, tumor which is again uh, subsified, uh, okay the same thing, okay, so this, these are uh, few uh, uh, dreaded scenarios where you go inside thinking that you can dissect the tumor and see it's, it's involving the phrenic, SVC, everything, the hilum is not clean. You can't do anything in this scenario, you just have to tell the patient take a biopsy so that they can, you can give some chemotherapy for these patients. And uh, uh, sometimes you can have the horn underneath the brachycephalic, this, this is, uh, very rarely you will find such a situation. So uh, this is my uh, uh, chapter in a, uh, in, a, in a book for elsewhere, uh, I think we are able to cover all the approaches and what exactly should be, uh, where, what should be used when, uh, if anyone is interested they can read this uh, chapter. Then I'll be talking about uh, empymas, uh, which is the, which is one of the most common uh, surgeries we perform. Okay, we about uh, 50 or nearly 50 percent of our cases are uh, empymas. So we do VAT decortication. Uh, so the, there are uh, there are uh, stage one, stage two, and stage three. Uh, the role of surgeon in stage one is minimal. In stage two, definitely you get involved. Uh, you, the goals of surgery will be aspiration of the fluid, you try to uh, 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 clean up all the fibrin material, remove the plurilent uh, effusion and all the inflammatory substance you have, give an adequate lavage and make the chest into one cavity so that you can adequately drain all the fluid and pus. In stage 3, the uh, uh, challenges are different, you have to uh, remove the thickened visceral and parietal pleura, you have to mobilize the lung completely, open up the fissures so that there are no pockets within that and also secure any major air lakes after the dissection. So this is uh, stage 2, okay, this is still you can see a good part of the lung, very nicely you have some uh, fluid, some uh, purulent material, some fibrins uh, uh, deposits everywhere. So uh, this is okay, this is a very easy one, you just try to remove all of, all of that possible, try to minimize the leaks and then uh, try to ensure that the lung is expanded. Uh, cover with good antibiotics and patient goes home in 3 or 4 days. So this is a scenario which is commonly, which we commonly face, a chronic empyema with a very thick peel. You can already see on the x-ray that the lung is here and the, this, whole, this whole thing is a peel. And then we go inside and you see a picture like this where you will not see any lung. It's just uh, everywhere there's a thick peel. In fact, uh, I was saying that we, we use a blade, actually we, I used a blade in this case also because there was no way I could use, uh, uh, I could uh, enter anywhere. Uh, sometimes what I use is I use the blade of harmonic, I cut the layer and then once we have the layer I then grasp it and then try to push it out. This is the peel which is found on the lava and this is the particle peel. So this is the, I think it's a level 2 difficulty. This is a very similar condition. You can see that almost the lung is moved into the So this is the ideal situation where you want to go in and you will find a good layer and you are Okay, you are just feeling happy that okay, every peel is coming out. This is a very good scenario. You would actually enjoy it. You you'll feel actually nice about this whole procedure. <laughs> but uh, unfortunately, we don't get this scenario every day. Again, uh, see, this is again a, a decent situation where you have the peel in your hand and you're trying to just strip off everything. Uh, I use mostly brand dissection with uh, peanut and. Uh, uh, a grasper. Uh, I sometimes use blunt dissection just to ensure that we ga can grasp something and then slowly you can And then once you have the layer in your hand, then you do the 
conventionally you do with uh, grasping and traction and counter traction. So, uh, this is a difficult scenario, you don't want to be in this scenario. <laughs> Then you have some nightmares. Uh, you go inside and you see the lung, it's like almost like a rock here. You try to see where your lung is ending and where the flora is starting. And this is a, it's a very uh, bad situation. In fact, when we do such a case, we actually go inside the lung after uh, go inside the pleural cavity after cutting a rib, a small segment of the rib, so that you can actually have access because there is too much overcrowding in the ribs. So then you go uh, dissect it out gently remove all the calcified uh, uh, pleura then try to release the lung as much as possible but one of the good part uh, in this case was I was actually contemplating to do open uh, quite, a, quite a bit of times but then when I started dissection at the, of the visceral pleura it was a little kind to me so I was able to uh, expand the lung well so then I just had to clear up the parental pleura and finish it. Just a small snippet of the whole thing. Yes, yes, you can see yes. it's basically like a rock, just trying to peel, peel, whatever you can, and then so it takes a lot of patience and a lot of time. It takes about two five hours minimum to do such a case. Uh, and, uh, the main idea again will be to completely mobilize the lung and try to create areas on the diaphragm where there is no, uh, there is actually some raw area so that the lung get, uh, so not on the diaphragm, on the chest wall so that you have the lung getting adhered to the Okay, I think they called it. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I think my all, all my videos are also done with it. Uh, so uh, that's all about uh, VATS decortication. Uh, I'm open to questions. Uh, see, uh, my uh, cardiac surgery training started with two most difficult uh, anterior mediastinal tumor surgeries. Unfortunately, both the patients needed CPB uh, support because of injury to innominate vein. Okay, sir. Tips where, uh, even today, unfortunately, I have that fear factor in my mind when I am operating this anterior mediastinal tumor. So, my perfusionist is always, always a standby because that just doesn't disappear, you know, though. Uh, all these years I have done 100 plus uh, anterior mediastinal tumors. So when you are doing it through VATS, are there any certain thymomas where you feel you should not get through any of this minimally invasive? Pre-op imaging, see if there is so, any plane, uh, if there is a plane between the thym uh, tumor and the thym uh, SVC. If you have a good plane, a contrast image, if there is a good plane, you need not worry, sir. The other thing is even if there is a bleed, first thing is just keep a cigar and press it and uh, even you don't have to use a cardiopulmonary bypass if uh, if you have a if you have pressed it and the bleeding is under control most of the times it will come it will it has, we can have control over the vein easily sir shouldn't be a problem anybody in the gathering had to use cpb support not <laughs> no Ha, no, no. Uh, no, in open, yeah, definitely we can just, uh, you can uh, uh, ligate the vein, not an issue, sir. That is there. But you have to need to have a control. Control. Manjana, <laughs> mm. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Because when you use CO2 insufflation, the planes you get a better yes, plane. Yes, sir. Like rather than not using no, uh, CO2, CO2 often, always, I think we should use CO2 insufflation to get a good planes. Agreed, sir. Yeah. I, I think uh, Dr. Bhushan he does subsified. Uh, yeah. In that, I, I don't know. Yeah, subsified. Uh, subsified unipotent non intubated tubeless rides. Okay. So, no, no. The patient is breathing spontaneously. Wow. Yes. Because, you know, the. Uh, Presently, I am working in Singapore, so they are using all CO2 insufflations. No, nowadays we do subsidies. 
No, sir. No, no, actually, no. even Dr. We started from Dr. Ali Zamir. So, he used to always tell us you see what is Yes, yeah. sir. That's what. Uh, yeah, that's good. Yes. And uh, regarding empyema, the hard uh, pill you said, right? Sometimes it turns to be, it turns out to be Malignant. mesothelioma. Malignant. Yes. Malignant mesothelioma. Yes. The, there uh, you need to stop your surgery and probably convert to open and do a radical pleurectomy decortication. Yeah. So actually, I, I don't do it at the same setting because you don't know about the, uh, the yeah. metastatic uh, uh, status. Yeah. Things uh, I normally see is uh, when we do a decodification, is the, the lung expanding, is the uh, underlying lung expanding. So if I see a in an area where the underlying lung is not expanding at all, uh, then I, I, I'll end the, the, you know, I'm creating more and more lung trauma. I, I tend to stop there. So, so and probably even say in the frozen of that peel, uh, uncommonly it comes as malignancy. So then you don't go ahead and do an over aggressive de de decortication where the lung anyway is not going to re-expand and they're going to create a lot, lot of leak. Sir, so, uh, so this is the same scenario. This patient had a, a CA lung, metastatic brain metastatic and all that. She had come with the chest tube for almost two months. Then I did a limited decortication where I just wanted to clear up all the necrotic material and allow the lung to expand. So, yeah, as you said, try to minimize as much as possible, try to debride minimum and try to stay away from the lung as much as possible in such a scenario. So, how over aggressive or aggressive you will be in decortication entirely depends on what you see in drop. So, the, it's a balance between uh, creating a lot of air leak, uh, no no lung expansion, and full air expansion and no air leak. So, so the ad comes with the more you do. Yes. So now now did this in a half an hour. I'll know if I'm going to do a aggressive decortication or, or just clean in the empyema and accept that. Uh, how often do you uh, create a plural tent? Because sometimes, irrespective of approach, the most important thing in decortication is to create a balance between, you know, residual uh, cortex versus creating air leak. Because creating air leak will actually cause more problems for the patient. So sometimes we create a, you Sir. know, plural tent. Rather Sir, than uh, trying to be very aggressively uh, removing the cortex. You ask the anesthetist to inflate and see if any part of the lung is restricted because of the peel. For example, if it's lying in the middle of the lobe and the lung is expanding, you don't worry about removing it. You can leave it. Because if your lung is expanding, then it, it, it hardly matters. If your lung is restricted, the, the inflation is restricted by that peel, then definitely you have to be, you can use energy devices and try to dissect it more aggressively. Sir. Yeah. Yeah, I, I have a slightly different uh, approach to that. See, I never, I never do a parietal pleurectomy at all. My main aim is to get the lung to the chest wall, as far as possible that too. But not at the expense of having an air leak or massive bleed or even at the expense of a thoracotomy unnecessarily. Avoid a the morbidity of thoracotomy really outweighs the uh, advantage of getting the lung wash, just washing, peeling as much as possible, otherwise just make some um, um, cuts, try to expand it, wash it, get good biopsies, know what it is, treat it medically, connect it to a suction, they do well. If the patient ends up with a big air leak, he's doomed. He will end yeah. up with a thoracoplasty or with a tube for like um, months together with yeah. a, and the empyema is going to get worse. And especially these acute cases, they do really well. And uh, you, there's, there's no way you can peel acute. So okay. only thing I, uh, I, my point of view in this case is if patient already has kyphoscoliosis, if like is already bent over one side, better to do a parietal pleurectomy because you're giving the chest wall to re-expand a little bit. 
otherwise they will you, you might give him a disease free life but he will have a morbidity which is going to carry forever young boy coming to us with a with the with the yeah. it, it, it with physiotherapy in 6 8 months they have good uh, recovery sir but you have to ensure that you remove the parietal fluid as much as possible parietal fluid to be versus no parietal fluid to be if you see a long term trend if we follow this patient over 6 months it doesn't make any difference Yeah. Those chests are going to expand eventually. The pleura is going to clean out. The disease process is going to come down. Even in case of tuberculosis and actual uh, pyogenic empyematosis. Yeah, you no, see, acute you is not a phase after six months. Yeah. It's just the six months. It will be almost. It's like a clean. No, but if it's already fibrosis, one would you? Resolve a little bit. Okay. And the role of pleural peel, the pleural, I mean, pleural tent. Yes, sir. Uh, as uh, Dr. Abhijit was telling, so the pleural peel is only done in bullectomies and. Yes, sir. Phase. Yeah, it's mostly done for if you are doing an upper lobectomy and you have post uh, lobectomy space, you try to bring the pleura down so that uh, you don't. Uh, what do you do for massive air leaks? Suppose if they are massive after post decortication, you know, it's massive air leaks. Uh, so you don't you don't go to that you don't, don't go to that extent. <laughs> you are in trouble at that point. Which is accepted like like you know hundred ml per hundred ml. No, you just start leaking. You just like you no, know, you don't go into that place. Just avoid. Even hundred ml might be troublesome sometimes. Yes. So what is this? Yeah, we have to see it, sir. I've never used it. Not uh, not up till 18 years, because they have that gland which is enlarged, and then slowly they it will normalize. The the whole gland is replaced by fibro fatty tissue by the end of teenage. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Now I request uh, Dr. Bhushan Thomber sir for wax lobectomy malignancy topic. Yeah, wax. Uh, uh, good evening. Thank you. Uh, wax lobectomy for lung cancer. I will uh, speak wax lobectomy in context for the case scenario. That becomes easy. The 70-year-old gentleman, chronic smoker, having recurrent cough. HRCT revealed 5 cm mass in left upper lobe. PET CT showed 5 cm mass in left upper lobe with tiny non-FDG mediastinal uh, uh, nodes, non-FDG avid. Biopsy adenocarcinoma and EBUS was negative. He was evaluated for surgery. PFT was done. Uh, FEV1 was 56%. DLCO was 54%. Echocardiography normal. Planned for VATS left upper lobectomy. So this is the picture. The tumor is in the left upper lobe. So double lumen tube was used, left sided, total intravenous anesthesia, paravertebral catheter for pain relief, urinary catheter, arterial line and a central uh, line. So uh, we went through uniportal uh, uh, left upper lobectomy VATS approach. 
So first, wait, wait. Yes, as you can see, uh, the incision uh, utility incision is fifth intercostal space anterior axillary line with the energy device as uh, harmonic scalpel. We take the anterior pleural cut. We can see the phrenic now here. So eventually we will uh, dissect out and we are taking the nodes as we proceed with the dissection then and uh, there itself. Always hold the uh, node with the perinodal tissue. If we can see this iotopulmonary window here. Some nodes are seen in the AP window. That we will t t uh, remove them off. Always perinodal dissection. Never hold the node directly. So you have to skeletonize the vessels. You take your uh, long uh, right angle uh, forceps. Make a uh, window behind your uh, pulmonary vessels. Sloop the vessels. You can uh, staple then and there itself, but generally uh, my protocol is sloop the vessels, dissect them out. Uh, before doing any uh, irreversible step, confirm your uh, anatomical location and then once you are ready, tell the anesthetist you are proceeding with lobectomy completely. Then you start firing the staples. So the left upper lobar artery, the apical and the apical posterior segmental vessels uh, will be looped. The advantage of uniportal is that anatomy is straight in front of you. So it is like as if uh, you are, you uh, imagine you were the assistant surgeon, you are assisting the boss in open surgery. So you have skeletonized all the vessels. Now you pass, you sometimes I take the artery first. You see, always we have to be careful while taking the uh, upper lobar artery. There should not be bite with the aorta here. Now you can take the vein. We take the curved tip staplers, tan or white, 30 or 45, whatever you have. You can see the already the mediastinal nodal dissection done here. Then we will be dealing with the fissure. Fissure dissection is being done. Here we will encounter two lingular vessels. And the pulmonary artery will be going from here to like this into the lower lobe. This is a lingular vessel. We can see two vessels here. Always loop and make a proper window behind your arteries. That gives a good area for your staple insertion. Do not use undue force. If you find it that uh, your staple is not going or something is getting tangled, you should remove the staple, reapply them. So you have taken the lingula vessels. Now remains the bronchus. Take the interlobar nodes. The interlobar nodes are taken care of. So again with your right angle forceps, you try to dissect and make a plane for the bronchus. Here is the bronchus, upper lobar bronchus. 
you can use a sloop you can use a rail tube you can use a infant feeding tube or uh, umbilical tape which i have used here because a pretty tough structure bronchus the sloop won't hold the pressure and traction so purple uh, reload we choose for the bronchus lobar bronchus especially in the left upper lobe bronchus many times you might be uh, catching this area of aorta also you have to be very careful and also the pulmonary artery from the behind which is traversing into the lower lobe you should always see the both the prongs of the staplers and uh, once you before you clamp you inform your anesthetist you clamp and ask him to inflate the lower lobe you are not uh, taking a side bite of a lower lobe bronchus as well so inflation test has to be done and all everything you see the lower lobe is inflating very nicely without much pressure so that confirms that you have taken only the upper lobar bronchus and you fire the stapler the lobar lobe is separated out you pay uh, put a uh, specimen extraction bag either a custom made euro bag in a posting fashion and retrieve the specimen and this is the complete picture and the level 7 lymph node i think so was remaining that uh, inferior pulmonary ligament release is being done so there were not many nodes in the le uh, level 7 group of nodes we removed then confirm your hemostasis confirm your staple lines then uh, obviously air leak test you should do this for the left side and now i will just demonstrate one lymph node dissection on the right side level 2 and 4 are so retract the, this was a triportal approach this is the upper lobe were retracted down this is the azygous vein draining into the svc these are the lymph nodes which were fdg avid this was a case of uh, uterine ca carcinoma which was treated long back and has only the recurrence in the mediastinal nodes that's why we are this is for a demonstration of uh, the lymph nodal dissection so take all the nodes in mass you always keep i always keep a cigar ready whenever there is any injury or anything it becomes very handy to keep, uh, keep pressure open the supra azygous pleura take all the fibro fatty tissue out you can see the uh, underlying vagus now here and its branches so below the azygous above the azygous everything should be cleared there was a load remaining here that again relook we have removed it out so this is our unipotal scar 
So the previous patient was uh, extubated on table, shifted to recovery and then ward after 3 hours. Chest vein was removed after 3 days, discharge on thrust post-operative day. Histopathology revealed adenocarcinoma 5 cm mass with node negative and margins negative. Uh, negative. Pla has been planned for adjuvant therapy. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? And yeah. Yeah, that's what. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, sure. Thank you. So our next topic would be Unipod Wax, Perimemory Approach by Dr. Norberto Santana, sir. Thank you very much again. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you very much again for the invitation. My apologies, but I have to leave to make another presentation. That's why I'm moving forward. So this is the disclosure of my presentation. So uh, the preliminary report that uh, emerged when we were looking for how to move away from the thoracotomy to less invasive uh, approaches due to the uh, advance in the uh, technology in minimally invasive thoracic surgery. Basically, the perimamary uniportal approach is a two, four centimeter vertical and curved utility incision in the perimamary fold. You can see the skin marking here. This is the head, so legs. Uh, so we can approach the four, fifth, six intercostal space. The, the choosing the costal space is a muscle sparing technique. You will see here the, the approach. And uh, providing surgeon with a good visualization of the highland, good exposure to the pleural cavity, wider utility incision that we show you in the next slide and easily converted to uh, perimamary thoracotomy is needed. So basically we open the skin in the curved incision, uh, divide the subcutaneous tissue, create like a pocket and split the uh, subcutaneous tissue up to expose the, uh, the uh, serratus, as you can see here, moving a little bit posterior. So now we, we don't do so much uh, this section around. And then opening the uh, intercostal space, usually the fifth intercostal space for me because I'm left handed. So the utility incision is a little bit more anterior than the regular uh, uniportal baths, but the same level. So giving a good exposure. You can see now we are at the level of the ribs, opening the intercostal space. You can see the lung now. So this is the approach, and uh, we use the uh, wound retractor, the Alexis, and we are ready to start with the surgery. 
So uh, as I was explaining you, this is the uh, difference, the significant difference between the uniportal, uh, regular uniportal, and the perimeter uniportal is a wider uh, approach, yeah, an anterior approach. So even it can be uh, used in patients who underwent previous thoracotomy or uh, other kind of surgery, like this patient who underwent a scapulectomy, uh, because the anterior approach is giving you more access to the pleural cavity to face any kind of addition that you can uh, uh, find uh, below. So basically, the primary approach is uh, giving us the opportunity to do a different kind of uh, procedure, lobectomy, cerebral resection, decortication, and even more innovative procedure. So I will show you my experience uh, over the year with some of them. Lobectomy, for example, like this patient, 50, uh, 59 year old female patient with uh, bronchiectasis, recurrent infection, the middle law completely destroyed. You can see the fibrous addition between the middle law and the pericardium, easily to detach, uh, placing the, uh, the camera at the posterior corner, so facing the, uh, the law in the opposite. So the dissection of the uh, hyaline, you can see the, uh, the uh, middle low vein. It can be easily dissected and skeletonized. The trick for middle lobectomy through the uniportal and even for, uh, for uh, perimamary is to divide the fissure between the uh, middle law and the lower law. So that's why we're not dissecting the uh, artery in the fissure when we have divided the the fissure at that level, so the surgery changed drastically because you are able now to mobilize the middle law and uh, dissect and staple the vessel uh, quickly. We have to be very careful with the uh, uh, vascular anomalies that you can uh, face any time. In this patient, we found after the division one more aberrant uh, middle low vein. divided with the vascular step as well. And then you have the exposure of the uh, airway. You see the middle lobe bronchus with the lymph node, with the uh, uh, lymphadenectomy to keep uh, clear the airway. So now it's easy to uh, dissect and circle if needed or staple the middle lobe bronchus. I don't usually use the, uh, the, the vessel loop just to save time. And this is the uh, uh, middle lobe artery. So it's a good exposure from the primary, and even you can see how can I uh, encircle both and then dissect it both and pass with only one, uh, no, reload both uh, uh, arterial branches to be divided. Now the middle of the vascular lines, and now the, the finite step is to remove it and take it out. So the, this is the postoperative chest ray, and the patient will discharge uh, on the second postoperative day without any complications. Also, we can do more complex procedure. We're moving into the cementectomy, uh, cementectomies or even subcementectomies to preserve more the, uh, the lung uh, function as lung sparing uh, technique. We all know that Uniportal bats, lung cementectomy are technically challenging due to the anatomical variation, more complex than the lobectomy, and a detailed comprehension of the cemental uh, anatomy is required to avoid, avoid compromising uh, uh, the viability of other remaining segments, and long experience and strong skills are needed to do uniportal bats uh, cementectomy. It was the first uh, report. Uh, primary uniportal bats fissureless right anterior cementectomy, and uh, we, we reported in jobs. And uh, this is the case 58 year old female patient, colon cancer with a 1.5 centimeter nodule in anterior segment. So, this is the surgery. So, we were using 4K technology, that's why the quality of the image is, is pretty good. So, we dissected the exposed uh, the highland. So, we are now dissecting, and this is B. B3B, I will show you now. This is the A3, this is the artery for the semen 3, and uh, A1. So we staple A3. And now we are clipping is a 3 B3B and B3A. So both. Uh, already a clip, and the bronchus is behind B1. This is B1, it's uh, a little bit more difficult 
to uh, a staple, but there is a trick, is to uh, pass a loop or silk, whatever, and then go between B1 and, and the, uh, the uh, Bronco for the segment three. So it's a good trick. So you can, you can divide it, sorry for the uh, poor quality of the image. We we're, were inflating the, the lung to make sure that we were dividing the right broncos. And finally, the uh, division between the segment three and the middle low, that's why it's fissure less technique. You don't need to go to the uh, fissure. You can save a lot of time. And finally, the division of the segment in a B shape, you know, uh, resection. as you can see here. So keeping the stamp with the specimen is really important to have a good uh, clear plan of the intersegmental plane. Okay, the, uh, the leak test and the rest of the uh, segment completely inflated without any any leak. The patient uh, was discharged uh, at the second post-operative day. This is the post-operative chest ray. Uh, the pathology confirmed the uh, column meds with free margin and no relax for the last three years. So we can do more complex cases by perimamal urine portal. This is a, a sub-cementectomy. Uh, unfortunately, a 15-year-old female patient with osteosarcoma metastasis, 2.8 centimeter nodule in the left S1 uh, segment. So we didn't want to perform lobectomy. It's a, cement, it's a metastasis. And even uh, we, we thought that the sub-cementectomy could be enough for her. So we did cementectomy S1 S2, A, and B, and preserve S1, S2, uh, C. So this is the, uh, the vein for segment 1 and 2, A, B. This is the, uh, the first arterial branch, S1, S2, A. Now we proceed with the dissection of the uh, uh, bronco, S1, S2, A, and B. A C, you can see it uh, or can find it in the, uh, in the fissure. This is B3. We have to preserve it. So when we dissected the airway, we then divided S1, S2B, uh, the artery for the segment, for the sub-segment. And then the, uh, the broncos. When you have uh, the vascular light, the, uh, the, the sub-segment is a little bit easier to uh, staple the, uh, the broncos. So we checked that we were dividing the right uh, segmental, sub-segmental bronchos. And then we proceed with the uh, sub-segmentectomy. Uh, this kind of segmentectomy is a B-shape as well, no, uh, resection to preserve the uh, sub-segment uh, C. This is sub-segmentectomy. And this is the final uh, aspect. We usually cover the area, the highland, with uh, T seal, and this is the final aspect of the uh, perimamary uniportal approach. So the patient discharged at the second postoperative day, uh, confirmed the pathology that uh, the patient was having osteosarcoma uh, metastasis, free margin, not a lot for 1.5 years, but unfortunately, at the second year, she had a, a contralateral massive recurrence, and uh, we couldn't do anything for her. So this sum of our results for uh, primary uniportal vas cementectomy, mean uh, operative time is 2.7 hours, then hospital stay 2.3 days, mean pain score is 1.6, uh, no complication, no conversion, no remission, and patient with high uh, uh, satisfaction. So we can do more with the primary approach. We can do uh, the cortication, even complex decortications in patients with empyema stage uh, 3 through the uh, primary approach. This is uh, a patient with uh, chronic renal failure, uh, empyema stage uh, 3 was extremely difficult to decorticate her. Uh, she had a, like a pocket in the pleural cavity, completely you know, full of uh, clots. And so this is the approach. So we mobilize the uh, visceral pleura. This is the parietal pleura. It's, you cannot see it now because it's the pocket full of uh, cloth that we removed. And now we continue with the decortication. Some, in some points, really, really stuck, and we have to go with the, with the uh, harmonic. Similar to the case that Osmanju was presenting uh, before. No? But the anterior approach through the perimamary, uh, I think, is giving us 
more chance to deal with this kind of cases because unluckily the lung is usually stuck to the anterior chest wall. It's more stuck to the uh, lateral and posterior. So the more anterior is the approach, the easier is the, uh, the decortication of the uh, axis. No? So I usually use hyaluronic peroxide many times, a hemostatic agent, and also uh, allow us to divide a little bit more the, uh, the plura. We continue doing sometimes in the middle long. A good trick is to bring it up through the utility incision to the corticate a little bit more. We continue peeling the, uh, the visceral plura, very thick visceral plura. See now the lung is decorticated, so it's reaching now the chest wall. Some hemostasis uh, is very important for this patient with uh, chronic renal failure. And in many of these patients, I use uh, tranexamic acid, intrapural tranexamic acid to control the bleeding. And aquamantis is a very nice, as we were discussing before, the aquamantis is really nice to control the uh, bleeding from the uh, predator plural, which is one. This is the land decorticate. Even we can do esophageal cases. It was a, a medical student, 24 year old female patient, who, who uh, came to our clinic with progressive dephagia, the patient was having a, you can see here, the lesion, and uh, esophageal duplication cyst, uh, we removed by perimama uniportal uh, bat. This is the cyst, clearly, extramural uh, duplication cyst. See, it was stuck to the, to the lung at the level of the inferior pulmonary vein. We're mobilizing the cyst first from the lung and from the esophagus. It's not a really difficult uh, surgery, but we have to be very careful with any perforation of the esophageal wall. You see, between the layer of the uh, esophagus, the muscle layer, this is the pulmonary vein we see now. Moving upwards, slowly, using the harmonic. I usually do by, by manual instrumentation, using the suction and the harmonic. And I uh, like to use the harmonic shears. That's why my question uh, before. You can see the inferior pulmonary vein, so we can detach the, uh, the cyst from the inferior pulmonary vein. without any problem. And the patient will discharge uh, the first post-operative day without any complication. So now we're moving into more innovative uh, fields for minimal invasive surgery, for perimamary and for uniportal is the rib cage or chest wall resections. So uh, we're doing perimamary uniportal using the gel port to insufflate some CO2 in patient like uh, this young patient with the osteosarcoma metastasis involving the uh, ninth rib and close to the diaphragm, putting CO2 to push the diaphragm down. This is when you can see here, primary uniportal, uh, dissecting the uh, intercostal uh, vessels and dividing the uh, rib with the uh, uh, scanlon rib cutter. This is a specimen, uh, eight and nine ribs with the uh, master below. This is the um, Final aspect of the approach, this is the patient uh, one month after the surgery, you can see the chest walls perforate. No? <laughs> Done, no? And the patient will discharge at the third post-operative day. So more innovative field, and in the last one, we are moving now into the uh, uh, cytoreductive surgery plus hyperthermic intrathoracic chemotherapy in an uh, unfortunately f uh, very young female patient with plural based sarcoma metastasis. You can see here the approach. This is the, uh, one of the plural based metastases. We are doing now a cytoreductive surgery is a pleurectomy, as you can see there, and uh, then place all the tubes to inflow, to outflow, and the thermometer through the uh, small perimamary uniportal to avoid you know, the previous uh, and classic approach for a high top. So it's more cosmetic. You can see the view, uh, intertoracic view, and uh, uh, to be able to um, give the patient the uh, chemotherapy. And the patient, this is the final aspect, and the patient will discharge on the uh, fourth uh, postoperative uh, day. So to conclude, uh, 
per i mammari unipotal bat is an unconventional um, bat versatile approach, safe and feasible, provides surgeons with the excellent visualization and exposure and wider utility incision, um, provide patients with a reduced length hospital stay, length, uh, less pain, and um, pretty good cosmetic results. Thank you very much. Happy to take any question. So we usually put two uh, uh, inlet, two outlet, and two thermometers. One apical, one basin to control the temperature. No, I don't usually exceed the uh, 41. So then, uh, uh, and depending on the case, we are uh, doing uh, intrapural uh, chemotherapy only, or sometimes combined with the uh, IV. It's called uh, by direction. Uh, uh, uh -huh. And the basal one will be, I will flood the chest initial with saline. Exactly. So that uh, the lung floats, and after, uh, with lung deflated, half an hour with lung inflated. Uh -huh. So that all areas will be covered. Exactly. That's why we, instead of doing that, we use two, two, uh, with the lung completely uh, uh, collapsed. Because, yeah. Okay. So you have uh, the circuit running very well. Uh, while you're doing segmented cases, do you use, uh, do you take the help of intercyanine green to differentiate the parent cable? ICG. Yeah, um, uh, sometimes when I have sand out, I usually do it. But when the intersegmental plane is clear using the insufflation deflation test, I don't use it. So I clamp the uh, bronchos, then ask the anesthesiologist to insufflate the lung, and I see the demarcation clearly. When I see the demarcation of the intersegmental plane, I don't use ICG. So you don't use ICG? No. One more question. When you are doing uriportal no. wax, where do you put the tube, the, uh, the chest tube? I think in your pictures it is showing it downward. It is from the down. Yes. Actually, in the in the in the uniporta perimamari because it's curved and vertical I'm putting in, uh, on the inferior corner. But you know in the general the uniporta thing the tube should be come from the in the uniporta regular in the uh, posterior corner. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, let's go to the next topic, what's lobectomy, inflammatory disorders by Dr. Shaiwal Khandelo also. Good morning everyone. Thank you Bala once again for inviting me. So most of the things have already been talked about what I am going to say in my talk. And I have tailored my talk for the beginners actually. The commonly, common indications in inflammatory conditions to do a lobectomy are bronchiectasis, aspergilloma, sequestration, destroyed lobe, cystic lesions, hydrated cyst. Challenges we all know are adhesions, difficult to, to access the pleural cavity, less working space, altered anatomy, neovascularization, and stuck lymph nodes to the uh, structures. Regarding the positioning, 
general anesthesia one lung ventilation with the help of DLT position has been extensively discussed already the basic concept is the spread of the intercostal space and the hip should be down so that you have a free movement of the camera can be done with the table broken at two places or you can insert a bolster under the chest wall particular attention on the female patient I try to keep it simple, nothing at to keep the hands. The patient is at the edge of the table, so there is a plenty of space to keep the hands here. I'll, usually these surgeries are prolonged, so ensure adequate pressure, padding at the pressure points. Always isolate the lung before you go for scrubbing after the anesthetist to clamp the DLT. And there is a you know, good 15-20 amount, 15-20 minutes, so that the, the trapped air gets absorbed and you get the space. Equipment has been discussed in detail by Dr. Bhushan earlier, so I won't spend much time on it. With the availability of the endoscopic staplers, actually the acceptability of wet lobectomy progressed in a big way in 90s. Long thoracic instruments. So there are plenty of approaches. So my approach is the traditional approach, scapula, martha, thoracotomy line. This is just above the diaphragm. And this is where I make the anterior and the posterior port. I am talking about the three port vats for these conditions. Uniportal can also be done, but this is a basic talk, so I am talk, going to talk about the three port vats only. First port for the camera, uh, the camera is introduced from here, and then from this port we decide the position of the other two ports. Local and anesthesia infiltration. Aspirate the air, it means that you are in the pleural cavity, possibly that this space is good to access the pleural cavity. Then we make an incision. We make muscle splitting incision, although these days in unibotal vats, a uh, wound protector is, is used where the muscles are divided. But the most important thing is a guarded and careful entry into the pleural space. And this is usually done under apnea. Be very careful while you are entering. Once you have entered the pleural cavity, put your finger in. I think this is the most vital step. Put your finger in, sweep and generate space for yourselves. If the lung is densely, is, uh, densely stuck and you cannot proceed, then look for the another side. Make a space for your, yourselves, introduce the camera, do a blunt dissection with the scope only, and generate the space to make another port either posteriorly or inferiorly or anywhere else. Extra port won't make any difference. I don't use wound protector. A deep stitch involving the muscle at the four corners of the, of the port. This allows me to keep my port open so that the lung does not expand while suctioning and the smoke can be evacuated easily. So this is the final look of the port. And then a camera is introduced and you do a inspection diagnostic thoracoscopy. Usually 30 degree camera is used. The safe access to the pleural cavity is very important. I have discussed this thing earlier. I could repeat it again. Single exploration. Do not force enter. Blunt dissection of the scope with the chest wall. Adhesolysis. Avoid lung injury. There is no definitive sequence of dissection. This is the final appearance camera port just above the diaphragm and the two anterior and posterior ports. So the another significance of this port placement is that see, most of the times in the earlier part of your career you will have frequent conversion. If you have to convert then you just have to join A to B. This is the standard decision for a postural lateral thoracotomy. Coming on to the approach. This is my approach where the camera comes from below. This is the conventional approach but the view is different. It's an oblique view. You are looking from the diaphragm towards the apex. This is not what you look, what the, the, the look you get in a traditional thoracotomy. 
The advantage is that the, there is a better hand-eye coordination. Your hands move in the uh, intuitive way. Both the hilums can be viewed equally, but the posterior hilum and the anterior hilum. However, there is a poor view of the suprahilar area. In the comfort, uh, comforting VATS view, commonly used in uh, unipotal VATS, many videos have been shown throughout this uh, conference. The view is that of a thoracotomy. It's a phenomenal view to look at the hilum, but there is a poor hand-eye coordination earlier. You really have to develop that skill. The time taken is long. There is a post, uh, poor view of the posterior hilum. If there are adhesions, you really have to pull the lung towards yourself. And sometimes the vision is not that great. It, this is better with uh, this uh, look of that. The approach can be uniportal, multiportal, two ports, three ports, four ports. Conversion is higher initially particularly in cases like aspergillomas or bronchiectasis. Please do not consider conversion as a failure of VATS. If you feel that the conversion is required instead of wasting time causing more blood loss, convert it early. The common indications for conversion is bleeding, abnormal anatomy, fecal adhesions, stuck lymph nodes and incomplete vision, fissures. Having said that, the VATS, even if you have to convert, VATS does have a role because the, most of the time these peripheral adhesions or most of the lung can be uh, mobilized with the help of VATS and really you have to make a tiny muscle sparing thoracotomy just over the hilum if, because of the difficult hilum or the incomplete fissures. You can do the procedure by open way, put your hands in but keep the camera of VATS in situ, intermittently look at the screen, you will have a better vision, if no, not at all, but you will have a better light. It, of course, the hybrid VATS avoids the, avoid the morbidity of a large thoracotomy. There is no standard technique, divide as you go, artery first is prepared, that, that is the uh, traditional teaching. The various two approaches are hilum first, fissure last, or fissure first, hilum last. So the biggest nightmare for me when I started doing this is independently was okay tomorrow I have to do a uh, aspergilloma lobectomy. The fissure is not complete. If the fissure is complete, the procedure is easier. So I will spend some time regarding a technique which is described by uh, this Belgian group for a tunnel technique for the fissure development in VATS. So opening the fissure completely with the help of early stages described in this technique, making a tunnel between the bronchovascular structures and the lung parenchyma, which provides a good anatomical view prior to the division of the bronchovascular structures. This reduces the post-op air leak and avoids accidental transaction of any, you know, if there is any anomalous anatomy. The tunnel, the uh, in this article, they have described the tunnel is made from anterior to the posterior, but you can go either ways. The main thing is to understand the anatomy. So, this is a scheme, schematic representation of how the posterior hilum looks once the lung is redirected anteriorly and you have opened up the posterior uh, mediastinal pleura. So, so, this is the main PA and you have to identify with the, you know, clear this thing main PA, this is the posterior segmental artery to the upper lobe and the superior segmental artery to the lower lobe. This is the exit point, you have to define it first and this dissection can be done very easily. Then you detect the lung posteriorly, you can take the table also, this is the higher view you have seen in uh, the video of the previous presenter also, superior vein, inferior vein, open this lymph node and pad of fat. You have a look at the secondary carina, take, dissect the lymph node, station 11 lymph node. You have a beautiful view of lingular artery and the basal segmental artery. So the tip of the stapler should always be kept above the bronchus and the pulmonary artery. I think the, what I adopt is once you have made the posterior window, you pass a go-rounder and you can gradually come across, pass a sloop or umbilical tape, lift it up. And then you can negotiate it with the help of a stapler. 
and then once the stapler is fired, one fire, two fire, beautifully the fissure opens and you can see all the structures nicely and then doing a lobectomy is a piece of cake. Similarly in the right lung, the lung is ejected anteriorly, you open up the posterior hilar mediastinal pleura, this is the trachea, a zygous vein, just below the zygous vein is the right main bronchus which divides into the uh, right upper lobe bronchus in the intermediates. Dissect it here. This is the exit point. This has to be cleared in my lobectomy, robotic lobectomy video yesterday. I have done this thing first. So once you remove this sump lymph node, immediately you can see the bronchus intermediates and the right upper lobe bronchus and PA is also seen. So once you have done that, go to the interior aspect push the lung, open this thing up. Between, this is the superior vein, lower lobe vein, this is the middle lobe vein. So clear both this area, this area. Talking about the major fissure first between the middle lobe and the lower lobe. So you see this middle lobe artery and the superior segmental artery. Clear this thing, this is the entry point, your exit point is already been cleared, you can pass a go around and lift it up and can open up the fissure. See how nicely this thing is opened up. Careful thing is that is the identification of the middle lobe artery and whatever you do you have to remain above the bronchus and the artery. In either never it should be the case that should go behind the artery. About the minor fissure between the upper and the middle lobe. You have already dissected it, the posterior exit site is already dissected, pass a go around, lift it up and you can easily open it up. So once this is done, all your structures are lying in front of you, you can staple them and can proceed with the lobectomy. This is our left lower lobe lobectomy, one of my earlier lobectomy, the te technique is very simple, minimal instrumentation with the same technique, three port vats, the camera at the basal port, inferior pulmonary ligament is mobilized, both, it has been dissected both from the interior, posterior aspect and the interior aspect. So window is made already, pass the artery, goes easily because both the windows have already been created. Uh, Elbows loop the structures, although it is not necessary now. You can use both the ports to use uh, to negotiate the stapler. Now I am uh, dissecting the anterior fissure, upper lobe, lower lobe. Visualize the lingual artery here because I am not contemplating an upper lobe acting, so I just stop there. Development of the fissure. This is the artery to the lower lobe the basilar branches and the superior segmental artery. The posterior part has already been dissected while I was dissecting the inferior pulmonary ligament. So I introduced an instrument beyond the superior segmental artery and the posterior segmental artery of the upper lobe and I could easily go beyond it. Sloop the posterior fissure and completed it. So essentially the technique is same which I have shown in the previous illustration but I have Once the fissure is complete, the artery is clearly visible. The stapler is negotiated and fired. The only structure left now is the lower lobe bronchus, which is looped. Once I clamp the structure, I always ask the anesthetist to blow the lung. You can see a beautifully expanded upper lobe. This patient also had some bronchiectectic segments in the inferior lingula, which were wedged out. The specimen was then bagged and delivered. Pleural cavity filled with the normal saline and the ALE test done. 
followed by the intercostal block from the outside. Single drain inserted, which is removed next day. Thank you. So, Bala, we would be taking questions towards the end. See, although classical, I got your question. So, the classical it is described as you have to separate it. So, two things. Mass ligation is although not recommended theoretically, but I have talked to various surgeons, done it myself, can safely be done. But the key thing what I have realized is that you have to proceed, introduce the staples from the base. This should be, uh, you know, uh, stapled sequentially rather than overlapping over the over each other. So if you go lift the stump up and pass the stapler from below, you can safely do the mass ligation. But the best way to do is, you know, ligate them sequentially. Yeah, even I agree with him and uh, sometimes uh, it's just impossible to do, separate and, and there's a pulmonary artery and bronchus just stuck and it dissected all around and you just can't go between those things. Might as well see the pulmonary artery and the rest of the branches, see the uh, bronchus, see everything and put a black stapler and come out much stay safer than just going through the pulmonary artery, tearing it, creating a mess. And in this situation, I would prefer to take a new stapler, whatever it costs. <laughs> uh, may I ask you, where did you uh, took those illustrative diagrams from? They were, they were amazing. Uh, you can get it, you can download it, it's freely available, sir. They were really good. It's I, it's I think it's important to realize that anatomy. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next we have rats bullectomy and uh, Unipot's rats by Dr. Rajiv Santosham, sir. One is on unipotal rats and the other one is on rats, bullectomy and uh, mediastinal mass excision. So it's not going to be about uh, when and what to do and when not to do and uh, contraindication, indication, not even about the anatomy. I'm just going to explain how these techniques are done. I do these uh, procedures and any uh, small tips and tricks that I have, uh, how I use the uh, suction, how I use the harmonic, my uh, choice of instruments, and uh, I hope it can help you. So for me, I, I was not never trained in uh, laparoscopy, so my, my training in uh, VATS was it from two-port uh, technique, from which I uh, went into a single-port technique, which was pretty easy to evolve. And, and uh, single-port technique seemed to be more easy than uh, two-port technique, as, uh, as already explained by the previous speaker, that. It's a more anatom anatomical uh, vision. So main division uh, di difference between multi and single port rats is that addition release. In multi port, sometimes you keep the additions just to uh, use it as traction. But in single port uh, rats, we have to use release all the additions initially itself so that you'll be able to maneuver the lung extremely and also articulate the stapler. So you maneuver the lung and articulate the stapler in such a way that they are both in uh, perpendicular, the vessels, the bronchus, etc. So this is this is the only thing that is different. Otherwise, I think uh, it's all about like doing what step is more comfortable, do the easy step first, etc. So basic things that we require are even protector, as we know. And I think in our country, it's not available now. I don't know how, if I can even tell, tell me where to get it, it will be great. Uh, and 30 degree scope and dedicated curved vascular tips instruments. OT setup always has in, in unipotal rats is the uh, surgeon stands in front of the patient, uh, assistant for me stands opposite, we have a little big mate so we don't fit in the same side. So camera is on the, on the 
screen is on from the head end of the patient if you are if you are lucky and we have two two like in our place we have one behind one uh, uh, one in front of the patient positioning already explained this uh, the the um, the the port is a three and a half to four and a half centimeter incision in the mid to anterior axillary line in the fourth or fifth intercostal space. How do I decide whether it's fourth or fifth intercostal space? Nothing to do with the CT. Nothing to do with the lobe that I'm going to do. All lobes, all segments, same incision. Only thing I, I take into consideration is the length of the chest. If it's a long chest, I put it a little higher. If it's a big, if it's a, no, it's just a subjective thing. I, it's a fourth intercostal space. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Fifth in, yeah, fourth intercostal space. Otherwise, it's a fifth intercostal space. That's how I differentiate. So, ah, like this, I, and, and if it's a two port, which I initially started, it's the eighth intercostal space, the fourth uh, is in the posterior axillary line. Always in the two port incision, put the higher port, upper first port first, the utility port first, because then you can, you're not going to go through the diaphragm. Me initially in uh, early earlier part, I've, I've gone through the diaphragm so many times. It's embarrassing, but I have done it. But once you start, once you put the utility incision under vision and put a camera like that and see, you're not going. That's not going to happen to you. And in anterior mediastinal masses, it's a little different. Like for everything else, it's a lateral lateral position and in front of the patient. But for anterior mediastinal masses, I keep the patient slightly uh, semi prone, semi supine, and I stand behind the patient. Incision is slightly higher and towards the midline, so we can approach it. You know, uh, yeah. So uh, uh, addition, complete release, uh, as I already explained, is very, very, very essential. Choice of energy uh, sources varies, but uh, release of additions close to the port, close to the port, is very more difficult than the ones away from it, especially in. Uh, like uh, inflammatory diseases, severe inflammatory diseases, you, uh, some t you can use a uh, combination of uh, blunt and uh, uh, harmon harmonic will be difficult sometimes uh, close by. So use uh, uh, diathermy and as you go away, you can uh, I, I use the suction and diathermy, Su I mean, suction and harmonic, suction and harmonic. I'll be, I'll be showing you in the, in the videos that I'm going to show later on. So intraoperatively, uh, dissection, of the entry and exit points of staplers are required. Not just entry point, the exit point also should be clearly defined, especially in single port valve. This is what I follow. I will show all those things in the videos. And removing the lymph nodes around the, around the uh, vessels is very important before going through the vessels. Earlier I used to just go around the vessel without removing the lymph nodes, even in benign diseases, and invariably go through the uh, artery. So once you like remove the uh, lymph nodes, especially uh, if you can't go between the lymph node and the vein or the vessel, or the vessel, you go on the node and push it off and with the harmonic, you push it and then dissect it off. Going around the vessel is much safer. And infused fissures, fissureless technique is, is useful. And uh, yeah, it's a technique. You get the vein, artery, bronchus, whatever first, and then the only remaining thing is the fissure. So that th those things I'll be showing in the videos. Control of bleeding, everybody talks about it. You know, you know, sponge on stake, clip, uh, and then, uh, and when the fish, fissure is not formed, it's partly, partly formed, and when the artery bleeds, you try and uh, put the pressure on the fissure, on the bleed, form the fissure, if uh, partly, and then try to clip, staple, or suture. This is uh, entirely up to the surgeon's skill, and it should not be according to the surgeon's ego. Patient will, uh, you know, because... Conversion is okay, but patient has to stay alive and has to come out uh, 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 well. So, few advanced techniques is, it's not like a basic, really advanced technique, but for d during dissection, I like to, give, uh, uh, to show you, tell you now before I show the videos is, I like to show, the, put the camera on top and um, hold the lung with a grasper and push it and with a suction in the left hand and the harmonic with the right hand, you can uh, have counter traction and traction to uh, Dissect. So this way you can keep moving the where you want the traction and keep sucking at the same time. Same time. And the uh, chance of fogging of the camera is also much less. Suction harmonic. So I'll just show you some videos. So, uh, yeah, I'll start with the. Uh, 
left lower lobe sequestration. How do I open this? Yeah. See, I'll be showing uniportal techniques, but I think it's the same for any other technique. You know, just that the camera is here, it's easier. In vision the anatomy is easier to understand. Here, this is the left lower lobe uh, intralobar sequestration. Here you can't see the artery first, but properly. But here you can see the, uh, in the uh, blood supply from the uh, this thing, from the aorta, descending thoracic aorta. If we start off always when the, when there are no additions, we always start with the, uh, into the nerve blocks. Additions of first release from the, the yeah. Now we can we are uh, trying to uh, release the inferior pulmonary ligament, and here the fissure is well formed. So we are just forming the uh, fissure and going to try and identify the lower lower pulmonary artery. So as we are going. Uh, So first we dissect the anterior part of the fissure. So here as I said, you know, we, we have to dissect everything around the vessel so that when you go around the vessel, you, you especially with the um, stapler, you should be right clear on either side. When you go on, you should come out of circulation, you shouldn't be poking on the other side. So everything is cleared around. So now the vessel is, this is a pretty uh, simple case because of the artery and all that. So once you dissect around the artery, you go around the artery then. So they use a curved tip stapler, go around it and staple the lower lobe pulmonary artery. Next we uh, dissect the inferior pulmonary ligament carefully because this is where usually the uh, anomalous pulmonary, the anomalous systemic arteries. So as we are dissecting, we keep a close watch and then we identify the uh, aberrant artery from the descending thoracic aorta and you go around it with the, uh, this, this, this instrument is uh, between a right angle and a, a curve and a artery first. I call it one, we call it 108, I don't know what the real name is. But it's much better than using a right curved artery or a right angle. It just goes around vessels and uh, it's also gives you, and, and you, as you see, I'm pushing the di diaphragm with the suction. And here, the suction is used to push the lung away. So the suction clears the smoke, keeps the, keeps the bloodless field and can also be used for dissection. Here the inferior pulmonary ligament is like com continued and you're, identify, you're going to identify the inferior pulmonary vein. See here, again, the suction is used when you're using the uh, for uh, it, it serves multi it's multi purpose. So you get the inferior pulmonary vein, you go around it. And this is given to the topmost instrument is given to the assistant or the nurse. So you go around it. So the suction is a great, great value. Now you gone gone through it now. <laughs> I think the only thing that's remaining is the bronchus. Yeah, like uh, as usual, you went to the bronchus and you put a st stapler across it and then uh, check for uh, inflation of the upper lobe. As everybody explained, it's the same thing. Take a clamp and then staple, ba upper lobe is inflated, staple, and then uh, put it in a bag and take it out. Uh, mi middle lobectomy. As the previous speaker said, one thing important in middle lobectomy I'd like to emphasize is we'll have to uh, form the fissure between the uh, middle lobe and the uh, lower lobe first. Hey, it's not opening. Like double click or do something else? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So this part has this is the middle lobe, this is the lower lobe. Okay. So this here the fissure is formed, but if it's not, this is a, uh, in fact, it's a case of uh, metastatectomy. Usually we wedge it, but here 
it's towards the highlands, so you're doing a, uh, doing a, this thing, right? doing a lobectomy. Here, if you notice, I found the fissure between the middle and lower rope. Here, we didn't have to use a stapler, as in most cases, but we have to dissect it. And as you see, as I already explained, to start removing the, uh, removing the nodes. And because of the suction, as and when you're doing the dissection, you can keep sucking it, keep the field dry, and know where to uh, buzz, etc. So you keep, you get the, co stay close to the node, keep dissecting, and uh, keep sucking. And now once the node comes off, you can see the vessel there. So remove the nodes first. See, so you can get the middle of vein right there. And this harmonic is a great instrument. You can use it as also to, as a, uh, to go around uh, structures partially uh, and use carefully. So it's for dissection and for, dis uh, and for uh, buzzing. So here uh, the 108 is used to go around. That, that's the instrument. That's how I call it. And then you uh, put the curve. Yeah, here in middle lobes, usually where there are small vessels, difficult vessels, always wear loop. Not all cases, but uh, when are difficult vessels, yes. And you loop it, and you pass the stapler. Staplers are always articulated. It's always articulated, so that uh, especially in uniportal rats. In, in two port rats, in the, the advantage is uh, when you are doing upper lobes, especially you can put the camera on top. Uh, in utility incision, put the stapler directly. You don't have to articulate as much, especially in the veins, upper lobe veins, which goes across. Here, you have to articulate quite a bit. Then, in behind that is the uh, bronchus to the middle lobe. Here again, you know, dissecting the bronchus. So you can use the suction, and as I'm, I'm, I'm emphasizing on the suction and harmonic, because my talk was basically about how I do it, and Dips and tricks. See again, there's a node there, which is important, which is essential. So this is a snake. It's a beautiful instrument, which can be got, which is really good for dissection in difficult areas. So, so I make sure the uh, node is away. And this is the other one, 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 the other instrument that I was talking about. This looks like a right angle. See, you can see the node there, which it have to be pushed away. Sometimes you get away with it, but usually it's not a good idea. I usually wouldn't do this when there's a node. Then again, I'm putting the uh, loop through it, taking it out. Yeah, and then use a loop it. Green stapler goes across. Again, articulated well. Then uh, what you are uh, remaining is the uh, uh, middle of vein, middle of. Uh, artery which is uh, again you know dissected if you can close the observe and using the suction and the uh, dissector suction is very useful if initially if this is little difficult if you want some more uh, pressure or you know some more uh, friction to hold using uh, sponge on stick is good but the advantage of you if this keeps like falling or slipping but the advantage of using this is the fogging is less and the blood doesn't get accumulated so again, you just put a stapler, and then you are find that there's another vein which you missed initially, in the middle of vein, the third vein. That also you get, and then you bag and yeah, the remaining part of the fissure you keep dissecting off, and the upper and middle lobe uh, fissure is not, not not formed as usual. Most cases it's not found. Here also it's not found. And we use a green stapler. And yes, it's very confusing for me at least. It was very confusing to know how to, which is the uh, fissure between upper and middle, which is the fissure between lower and. Uh, and it's easy to say, you know, just uh, inflation, deflation, uh, vessels go through. The, but it comes over time only. I cannot ex exactly explain. But yeah, if, for example, in lower lobe, uh, fissureless technique. Then it's pretty, uh, it's easy, but Fisher sometimes I'll finish the, dis I used to finish the dissection in like one and a half hours, and then wait for another one and a half hours just to get the Fisher. And, and it used to seem to look easy, but I think over time, I think you have to spend time on that, uh, learning how to uh, get the Fishers. It's a matter of uh, practice, even in segments for, like, for that matter. Uh, I'll, I'll come to like some, uh, 
Uh, yeah, and this is like a small case which is really nice for like uh, to see because it's a very simple uh, uh, fist. Just one, uh, there's just one like page. Yeah, there's just one cyst in the posterior, uh, uh, no posterior mediastinum. Just wanted to show that even there are some certain things you can start off with stuff like this. We just go inside the behind the pleura, I mean, around the pleura, and just keep. It's a benign cyst, benign tumor. Patient just complained of some pain. This is diagnosed. You know, and, and all you need to do is just keep uh, close to the cyst and close to the pleura, and just you push it, it just comes off. You know, you can start off with cases like this, and especially in unipotent, it's not a big deal at all. So this be a, and some uh, a case of bullectomy, a simple bullectomy I'd like to show. This I, I made one of my junior colleagues to do this. It was simple. Uh, I just want to show one point in this. See, this this is just one tiny uh, bulla there, which caused caused a pneumothorax. So here you are holding it like this with the instrument. I would rather hold it like this. You know, can you see? If you're able to understand, if I'd rather hold it like, like this, like this, and put one stapler that rather than like this, and see what happens. Uh, there's one, there's one firing here, and uh, it goes another firing. You know, here what you should have done is to hold this lung, hold it like this, and gone like that. You know, there are three firings instead of one firing in this case. So I just wanted to show that three or four, you know, many firings. It's a tiny bleb actually, it's not even a bulla. It's a, uh, so, you know, it should have gone across. Maximum two could have gone. See, for a tiny, uh, you know, very tiny bleb actually. So I just wanted to show that. See, the bleb is only that much. Uh, and most bullas are not like this. Actually, in fact, like when I saw all the cases, 50% of the bullas in the last two uh, uh, years, I don't know, it's only for me, were all lobectomies. It is all coming from the hilum, involved in the vessels. Uh, and, and I didn't put one of those, but uh, this is uh, another uh, bulla. The uh, recurrent pneumothorax with the Large bulla. See, this is what I was telling you. Know, the, the, the additions close to the lung are difficult. I have like thick fingers and like blunt dissection also is really difficult for me. So I do a little bit of blunt dissection. I have a great assistant like uh, Dr. Amsami. He like shows me really where to the camera. See, I either use like a curved hook or a long pit trim tithermy till we get to a point. Till when we can put a uh, wound protector. After that, yeah, using a harmonic and suction, as I already showed you, works wonders. You know, just push it to the suction, harmonic. Push it to the suction, harmonic, and there you can see the uh, bulla. Once you see the bulla, you can, yeah, as I said, all additions are to be removed in unipotal watch technique. In other uh, port technique, you can leave some of the additions behind and uh, uh, do the procedure or you know, do whatever is needed and then release also here everything has to come out otherwise you will not be able to mobilize the lobe now and and not yeah yeah additions additions lots of additions yeah and after that like uh, put the it's a fill it with saline expand the lung and I like to use this lung, lung holding like that to push the, uh, push the lung inside rather than a suction which sucks out all the water sometimes. You know, and you, you enter the site of the leak, you can slowly see. Yeah. And once you identify, it's a long, it's not just a bulla like this, it's a sessile bulla involving a lot of uh, space. Um, so multiple firings were needed in this case. So it's not just a, you, you, like most YouTube videos will have just one bulla like this and you just fire it. There are a lot, I just want to explain that, need even a lobectomy. Lot, 
of them, at least I see, in the last two years. Uh, do I have time or? I had like, there are two talks, so how much time do I have? Do I have any time left? How should I? It's all interesting. This is also a simple case, it will be interesting to show. It will be more encouraging to see. Or you want to see a segment like to me? Do you have time or it's done? How much time is over? Yeah, this is a case, 15 minutes, 30 uh, yeah, okay. This is a case of a, uh, I think it was, yeah, apico-posterior segmental uh, um, aspergilloma with hemoptysis. So here is like, uh, trying to feel it, feel it, no, no, we couldn't feel it. Then we used the, pulled the lung to us and uh, palpated it. It was an apico-posterior segment. We didn't want to do a uh, lobectomy, uh, left upper lobectomy. So uh, here we can see that uh, I'm, uh, yeah, hilum is, uh, the anterior part of the hilum is dissected. We're getting a vein, dissecting the vein, as usual with the suction. See here, like these kind of bleeds, immediately the suction is clear up and you don't have to keep taking it out, putting a sponge on stake, you know, and uh, clearing the camera from the, for the fog. And you just make sure all the water, which are water veins, you know, this is the, probably the anterior vein, I think, anterior segment vein. And here, yeah. Apico posterior. Slow, yeah, see here, the nodes are being slowly dissected off. It's important to remove these nodes. And once you bear these nodes, as I keep saying, and repeating myself, that dissection becomes like so much clearer. Because I, I, in the beginning, I never used to do that, and I used to mess up a lot. And I, I was like kind of, uh, once the nodes are out, it's so beautiful, and you can just see it. Yeah. Yes. Here you can see that the suction can be used for dissection also partially, not too much because it tends to bleed for me, in my hands at least. Yeah. Yeah, here you can see the hydropulmonary node which has been also pushed. You got the, all the all the uh, tributaries of the veins, uh, trying, to, uh, trying to identify the pulmonary artery, uh, main pulmonary artery, pushing the pulmonary the the node away, nicely dissecting it off, bearing the uh, uh, PA. So you see that you know you should be uh, in these case, in unipotal cases you should be able to always move the lung all around. You know? It's very important, and yeah. The yeah, apical branch is take, being taken. <coughs> yeah, we'll make sure that the six segment uh, artery is not being not going to be taken. So you take that. Vessels are taken one by one. See again. More distal you go, more you clean clean it up. Yeah. Apical posterior bronchus is taken. Then by inflation deflation technique, you realize where the fissure is, you get an idea. And uh, the multiple firings over it.
and you bag it and take it over. Yeah, that's about it. I think I'll stop with this. From the audience? Yes, uh, unit portal. Uh, where do you have the, the camera in the body? Is it mandatorily yeah, on top? Is yeah, it mandatory? I'll, I'll just, see, I'll, I forgot to explain that always. Always the unit portal is standing in front of the patient, mid axillary line, fourth or fifth intercostal place, space. Camera always on top when you're standing in front. Then next comes the other instruments, back to back. Usually camera on top, then the so, grasper which is given to the assistant or to the nurse, usually to the nurse, and you have the rest of the two instruments, the suction and the harmonic. So that's how we do. Do you use 5 mm camera or the 10 mm camera? 10 mm, 30 degrees scope. 5 mm or 10 mm? 10 mm. Not the 5 mm, the smaller one. Uh, I've and seen it, but, I've, I, but I've, I felt that it's so small, the, I've never even tried it. I just tried put it so, in, putting it in. Yeah, one uh, have you have it, if you have experience, is it good? Yeah, yeah. So in yeah. The, the people are using 5 mm cameras now. Yes. Resolution, yes. Your resolution is very good in the pictures. Okay. <laughs> and one more point, you know, when you are doing uh, wax bullectomy, uh, so can we use talc pleurodesis for? I always use no, talc. No, no, let me tell. I, I is it is it carcinogenic in young patients? Because I don't know. <laughs> they, they say yeah, there is a controversy. There is a controversy yeah, here. Controversy, but talc yeah. works really well and it's because, faster, and you don't have to remove the pleura. It's bleeding. Yeah. So in general, after bullectomy, they do pleur. I mean, wax bullectomy, they do pleurectomy. But sometimes, you know, we use uh, talc pleurodesis also, which they say young patients we cannot use it because of carcinogenicity. Is it like pleur? I'm not really sure if it's proved. But I usually use it always. One, twice when the, I couldn't find talc, I did a pleurectomy. But just messy and yeah, takes another 10, 15 my point minutes. Is, so is it advisable, the talc. My point is, is it advisable to use talc when we are not able to do, is it carcinogenic in the long, I don't in the long term? Is or is Anybody else? Uh, my concept with talc pleurodesis, uh, in Tata Memorial also and uh, in my practice, we, I have done extensively talc pleurodesis for malignancy. And one or two percent of patients have died because of ARDS and uh, this thing. Okay, so especially young patients, these bullectomy patients are 16 years, 18 years, and they have to go long way uh, through their life. Mm. And uh, CABG and all these things are into the picture in future. Yeah, yeah. And future lung surgeries may also come into picture. So that's why I don't put any talc or any foreign body into the chest. Just do a good plur uh, pleurectomy, put hydrogen peroxide, make the surface uh, rough, increase the surface area, put a suction and do. Even if, what if happens if uh, it, does, uh, it doesn't work, it fails in post-operative period. Take 50 ml, 100 ml of patient's own uncoagulated blood and put into the chest one time and uh, hang the chest tube uh, higher up from the chest. Put a euro bag. This is blood patch pleurodesis works, definitely. Uh, so I, I, I don't use uh, alk if it's a young individual. Uh, I do a or I do a or la operation, leave some blood there. I don't suck all the blood out. Okay. out. Uh, in the age of lung transplant, uh, you don't really know who, who, who is going to need a transplant. Mm -hmm. So, so, so uh, until you do your talc, uh, it becomes pretty hard to entertain in for a re re redo lung surgery for or a probable transplant later. So unless they are really old, like I say, I higher. Yeah, I agree with you actually. I, I, we probably have to do talc, regular uh, pleurectomy rather than. Yeah, uh, uh, when you are uh, lifting the structures with uh, vessel loop, right? Yes. So you are using the vessel loop to lift the structures. Sometimes can we use this, uh, silk to lift it up and. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah so only thing I like vessel loop because in case somebody pulls it or something, no? No, the advantage of traversing the vessel. The advantage, is you, the advantage of using the silk and the disadvantage is the advantage is uh, the, if the staplers are included in the silk, that's yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's one okay. Thing. That's and the disadvantage is it, they cut through. They cut through. Yeah. So that's one. That's one reason. One more thing, I want to just one one point when I talk about uh, I don't know I don't know about other rats. Uh, Unipotal rats, when you put the instruments inside, I never put the, inst like I said, I pick up the 
bulla like this, right? But otherwise, I always hold inst uh, uh, hold uh, structures like this. I don't know for some reason it makes uh, it simple. Like uh, rather than holding it like this, it goes and hits somewhere. Here it's more uh, anatomical. Yeah. Yeah. That is more ergonomic. Yeah. I, I don't know why, but it's uh, easier that way for me. Yes. Have you encoded clashing of instruments in uniportal? How much is your incision? Four centimeters, five. I make it three and a half to four and a half. Earlier I was doing three. I used to measure it with the uh, this thing. Have you encoded? Have you encoded? Three and, 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 half, three and half. Now I just am more generous. I'm more four and a half. I think. <laughs> and it doesn't. I, I don't. Uh, it doesn't matter, right? I used to like have a pen. I used to have a scale and make the incision with eleven blade like this, and I will not increase it. But it was okay. But uh, we could do it. But now I'm, I just don't even. I just yeah, uh, I think it's four So if you encounter clashing of the instruments, probably you'll extend your incision. I don't. You, I, I, at this point, I don't uh, encounter clashing of instruments. Uh, if you have a uh, honest, uh, cameraman who has, you have no, uh, who has no, who's terrible, then you'll encounter a lot of problems. But clashing of instruments usually are not a problem. Well, probably if because you, how I do it is, one instrument goes like this, next instrument goes like this. So you put the camera like this. On top, on top, it's always on top, held like this. So the next instrument is a lung holding, let's see. The lung holding, yeah. it go, goes like this, extreme like this. So it only goes like that. Yeah. The other instruments are probably in the high limb, working with only two instruments. So the uniportal, yes. say the traffic light uh, principle, the traffic light yeah. signal. Yeah. Put a, sometimes, yes, if you put two um, lung holdings or something, it might be a little difficult, but because of that, I don't usually extend, but initially itself I extend. If it's a large tumor, for example, I, sh uh, I did a uh, 8 by 10 centimeter incision. Then I put about 6 centimeter incision and did it. And in, and in fact, afterwards I had to extend the incision further, put a spreader and I had to pull it out. So, but, but actually putting a spreader in the end and pulling it out is definitely less painful than having a spreader during the whole uh, uh, procedure. Definitely. Other than just putting for a few seconds, pulling out the, inst uh, the tumor, you know. In fact, in uniportal VATS, there is a special soft tissue uh, retractor device available. So, uh, you have siliconized uh, individual uh, uh, inlets. Gel port here. That is for, uh, usually for, uh, I think that's for we don't laparoscopy, use them right? Sales port. Uh, no, we don't no, use no. them. So, we don't use them no. uh, yeah. just to avoid that clash of instruments. Clashes. Yeah, the ribs are there. Oh, they all. Is now existing only in the thoracic world. I don't know how long it will exist. Oh, they use is it sills? Yeah, I have used. I have done sills. Oh, in thoracic? No, 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 no. Abdomen. All that I removed with sills. But anyway, I just want to, anybody knows where to get the wound protector? It's not Any other company or something? No, no, it's not available. With you? Metronic doesn't have any more. There's no, no stock in the country. Stock is finished. Uh, it will come in uh, one Two. That was told to me three months back. <laughs> <laughs> no, because we don't have it now. It's a big, I don't have anything. It's all torn. I reused and tore everything. You, one uh, you, thing uh, about your sequestered to me, uh, hmm. That is one extreme. Other extreme, it will be so small, you just keep on dissecting, it will just come off in the harmonic. So, I am wondering, suppose, uh, if there are small branches to the pulmonary, small, like, you know, left upper lobectomy, 
Can you put those hemlock clips instead of the staplers? We can save money. I put, I not, I put for these vessels, and you know, I've seen um, Diego's there video. There is no put. problem using and hemlock clips, right? And, uh, I'm, I'm very, uh, I'm scared when I suction it and all. No, when I put a suction close by. I do sir, a lot of vendors. All children are welcome. No, my, 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 my,
in that cases we can prepare st take standby for our heart lung machines otherwise there no use for uh, heart lung machines uh, for this uh, media cell tumors okay is also during aortic surgery sometimes we divide the nominate yeah. mm -hmm. earlier days i used to harvest a vein saphenous vein and then make a bigger tube out of it and repair the nominate but we stopped doing it now Thank, okay, you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. So we are at the end of the session. So thank you, uh, Bala, for organizing and conducting this. Very importantly, thanks to all the speakers for sharing their expertise, sharing their videos so open-heartedly. Would love to see some of these videos on you portal. Uh, you, uh, some of you must be having YouTube. So please do upload. It would be really, uh, you know. Oh, great. Oh, so. <laughs> so we, uh, I'm sorry, we have one more uh, uh, talk. <laughs> Sir just wanted some physical activity so that you get up and sit, so he told that. <laughs> Let's uh, go with our last but not the least topic. What staplers, consumables and your innovations? We have seen a lot of theoretical, medical, now let's see innovations and applications. Uh, this is by Mr. Lakshay Basi from uh, Medronic team. Thank you and good afternoon to everyone. I'm Lakshay and I lead the surgical staplers uh, and instruments marketing for India. I'm from Medronic and uh, uh, it's, it's our honor and pleasure to be here and I'll be taking everyone through the uh, you know, the products and the journey Medtronic has had uh, over the years in thoracic uh, surgery. So, uh, a bit about the portfolio. Uh, if you see, these are the laparoscopic staplers. Uh, Medtronic had a rich history dating back to 1990s. And, uh, you know, all these staplers that we see on the screen were, uh, you know, used classically in all the thoracic procedures as well as the colorectal and other bariatric procedures. So, you know, these are the straight reloads. So, there has been innovation in staplers as well as reloads. So, you will see somewhere in two, before 2005, we had straight reloads. 2005 onwards, we had, uh, you know, articulating reloads. 2011, we started with iDrive, which is the powered uh, uh, stapler. And, and if you will see, uh, curve tip, which is one of the most famous, uh, you know, reloads in thoracic surgery, was launched globally in 2011. So, uh, so we, we actually have a decade and more than about two or three decades old uh, technologies in staplings. Now, uh, I love this slide because most of the products on this slide belong to thoracic surgery. So if you will see, this was iDrive. This was, this, uh, this was, I would say, because this is discontinued now. We have Signia now. This was the pre previous generation or the first generation smart powered stapler. Then we had EndoGIA radial reloads. This is a radial uh, reload. Uh, which uh, you know can be used either in thoracic for uh, wedge resections or it can be used for colorectal ultra low LARs. Then we have uh, other reloads, but if you see in 2014, we launched preloaded buttress material reloads as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this one. And then 2017, we launched Signia globally. In India, we launched it in 2019. So I'll take everyone through Signia. So this is our technology which is called uh, tri-staple. So usually tri-staple means three rows but uh, with us it is not just three rows. So if you will see the innermost staple is smaller, the middle one is a bit bigger and the outer one is the biggest. So it is like three different steps on either sides. What it does is it allows greater perfusion into the tissues and less stress towards the inner side. This mechanism ensures there is more blood coming into the tissues and the chances of necrosis reduces. Uh, then the performance on variable tissue thickness is also the best. Uh, we would like to share that this technology is now common to all metronic staplers in both laparoscopic as well as open across thoracic, bariatric, colorectal and everything. So this becomes the quite an important one for us. Then all these specialty loads are available in India. We have the radial loads for wedge resection. There is curve tip uh, technology for vascular stapling. Then you have the black 
uh, reload. This is used in lipectomies. Uh, this is the so this black is is the the it is the highest staple height of 5 mm across any reload in India. Then you have the shorter one, which is 30 mm, and of course the buttress material. So these are quite quite special reloads for thoracic surgeries. Now. Uh, we come to the guns. So we have two different kinds of guns. Uh, so this first stapler is called universal stapler. The beauty of this is uh, any color, any shape, any size, any specialty of reloads can be attached. Uh, so that is the beauty of this stapler. It's called universal gun. And with other players, you know, you would need different guns for different sizes. Not with us. So it's available in three different shafts. The smallest one can be used in thoracic. So endo GI UXL, this one here, endo GI short. Now we, I, you know, uh, I would like to then come to the most advanced staplers, and there are many thoracic surgeons in India who are using this, uh, you know, Signia. Now, Signia is uh, the only device that has got everything powered. It's powered rotation, articulation, firing, jaw opening, and jaw closing. There is no other stapler like Signia globally with any company, and we are proud to have this. You can do as many. So it it comes with automatic tissue sensing as well as adaptive firing technology. So what it does is it senses the tissue and then it decides how fast or how slow I should go depending upon the tissue thickness. Uh, so uh, yes, so I was actually talking to Dr. Abhishek Jain yesterday and uh, sir told me that he's uh, a very avid user of Signia. You know, he uses Signia in every case. Uh, now this, this Signia actually shows you three different zones. This is to minimize uh, the errors at the surgeon's level and also to ensure that the stapling formation is better. So it shows you three different zones depending on the tissue thickness and the type of reload that you have selected. Zone 1 on Signia means that it will fire optimally at good speed of uh, between 5 to 8 seconds. The middle one is zone 2, it will fire between 10 to 12 seconds and the zone 3 is means that it will fire even slowly at almost 16 to 18 seconds. Uh, why would it go to zone 3? Because if it feels that the tissue is too thick for the reload that you have attached, it will fire in a graduated or a very slow fashion. Because there was a study which was conducted uh, to uh, you know, showcase that in very thick tissues, if the firing is done slowly, the optimal B-shaped staple formation takes place. Uh, Signia is the only smart powered device which can do 300 cases from one stapler. Just like the manual gun, you can attach any color, any shape, any size. And uh, yes, so we can definitely help you with a lot of thoracic surgeons in India who are constantly using this. It gives you real time feedback on OLED screen. Uh, so it tells you what's happening at the distal end. What is the zone it is firing in? How much is the battery left? Just like our phones. And you know, we are proud to share one more thing that it is the only device which can be charged like a cordless phone. So you are done with the case, just put it on Signia charger. It will get charged in 3 hours, you can run for 18 hours. Uh, so as I was sharing that it has universal reload attachment capability. Any color, any shape, any size and any specialty. You know this specialty that I was showing earlier, all of these can be attached with Signia. So more than 50 reloads can be attached with Signia. Now I come to the uh, the reload. Uh, now we have this uh, tri-staple curve tip. As you can see, it comes with three rows on either side. And uh, uh, you know it, it actually gives very less tension to the tissue vessels compared to the echelon flex as we have. And uh, yeah, so we have this curve tip tri-staple, which is uh, one of the most preferred reloads for vascular stapling in thoracic. Uh, there are a lot of testimonials uh, by Thomas Fabian and uh, Dr. Uh, Shanda H. Blackmon and uh, you know they are constant users of this and uh, curve tip handles appear useful to, uh, you know to, to speed thoracoscopic lung resections. Uh, now it actually saves time in thoracic surgeries as well as it has been proved. Now this is going to be very special. Uh, I would like to share this one. Now this is the first time that I am sharing this in India. This is going to get launched in next three months. This is the only reload for thoracic surgeries that comes with a 6 mm anvil. 
So imagine this is the thinnest reload that Metronic will launch in India in the next three months. Uh, so it will have a very long shaft and a very slim anvil over here. So it and the reloads, the, the reload with two rows of staplers on either sides of the cut line. Uh, what it will do is it will deliver superior hemostasis and of course it will ensure that uh, the, the, the vessels uh, take less space. It will have a very long shaft. Uh, it will ensure easier maneuverability as well. So we are really gearing up for this product uh, globally. Uh, this is Metronics. Uh, in fact, we are proud to say that this year the in the reload space, Metronic is extremely bullish with this reload uh, in thoracic surgeries. Now we also have a very rich uh, history. I'm sorry. We also have a very rich portfolio and history with open stapling. This is the directional stapling, a very dog bone shaped anvils, ensures proper B-shaped staple formation. Uh, so, and if you see the transverse section in directional stapling, our, uh, you know, the, uh, if you make a transverse section of the staples, it will be rectangular, not rounded, just like others. Uh, we have this GIA staplers, it, it can be used in open thoracic surgeries as well. This is a two row one, uh, and we have actually launched a three row open linear cutting staples as well. That's called tri-staple GIE. So the same tri-staple technology is now available in GIE as well. So you have the options of both two rows as well as tri-staple three rows. This is also another uh, stapler. It's called TA stapler. It's a linear stapler. It's not a cutter. So uh, the cut line is provided uh, so that you can cut the, the lungs from the one side while you staple it. It is. It can be conveniently used for wedge resections. <coughs> Just like the uh, the radial reloads where you have a curved resection. Uh, moving on, we also have a very rich portfolio in trocars. Uh, so I'm done with the staples. I'll just showcase the trocars as well as uh, the wound protectors. Then you know there is a dolphin. There is a dolphin nose tip that we have, which is quite unique, and a ribbed cannula. Uh, now comes the surgery sleeve. Uh, so Dr. Rajiv uh, Santosham was talking about this and. Uh, Sir is right, we have some challenges in terms of global supply because of disruptions. So this product is not available in India right now for at least two months, but we hope that it will be shipped very soon from US. Now, this is a wound protector, which is extensively used in at least three different surgeries in India. One is the thoracic procedures, the second one is gastric procedures, and the third one being the colorectal. Uh, there are five different sizes available. Uh, the smallest one, the middle, and the large, extra large, and extremely large. Interestingly, the largest one can be used in C-section surgeries as well. And uh, we have two surgeons in Hyderabad who are using this in C-section. But moving on, uh, in thoracic, it can be extensively, uh, it, it can be easily used. Uh, the wound protectors uh, ensure that you have larger area to work. There is enough retraction provided. And at the same time, uh, uh, you know, greater wound exposure is there. And the price of this uh, this simple device is not high as well. It, it is extremely, extremely, extremely inexpensive. Now we have a surgeon here using this Signia, and uh, you know the, with the with the reloads. And here you can see the uh, uh, you know surgery sleeve in the picture. Now as a part of document, we know that uh, globally surgical to prevent surgical site infections, wound protectors is a part of uh, the practice. Uh, moving on finally to the hand instruments and clip appliers, we have this interesting device. It's it's a preloaded multi-fire clip applier. So imagine a clip applier that has 20 and 30 clips preloaded, and that comes with better technology in terms of grasping. So this is quite an interesting device because it closes at distal end first and then it closes proximally. This is called premium surgery clip. Then we have another device. If you want to use it in uh, laparoscopic or VATS procedures, then you can use this endo clip, uh, 5 mm. It has preloaded 16 clips, and uh, this is for laparoscopic. So the previous one was a preloaded multi fire in open. This one is a preloaded multi fire in uh, laparoscopic procedures. This is the last one. Uh, so uh, we have this product called FRED just four or five drops of this on the scope and we guarantee there will not be any fog formation uh, on the scope yep. for at least for the next 40 minutes that's it thank you
Any, yeah, please. Yeah. So, talking about your stapler, yeah. so I am sure that most of the surgeons sitting in the room have the same experience. Our Indian tissues are not like Western tissues. The post tuberculosis, they are thick, fibrotic, calcified, and I have experienced even while using this white cartridge, the staple will misfire. Which cartridge, sir? White, white. Uh, black, sorry. Black, white, yeah, yeah. The staple will misfire. So I am just worried by the feel of the hand, we know that it is going to misfire or this much force we have to apply. How about this electronic insignia device? Would that device be, handle, uh, be able to handle that kind of uh, stressful tissues? Uh, I am hopeful, sir, that it will be able to handle. In fact, what we can do is we can try Signia with a reinforced reload that we have in India now. And uh, we can pair that and uh, we can definitely... Reinforcement is required for LVRS. Those yeah. tissues are already fragile and very yeah. soft. That's not going to be a challenge. I am talking about a different scenario. We can, we, we can definitely see that with Signia, sir. I am really hopeful that it will be able to do its job. Because it will, f it will go slowly and will ensure that the staple formation take place slowly in about 17 to 18 seconds. So... Uh, I am saying that whether staple formation is going to happen or not. <laughs> <laughs> sir, if there is one thing, sir. We can, we can do one thing, sir. So, if you have, if you have Signia with the, with the black reload, the tristable 2.0 black reload, and if Signia feels before firing, after clamping, that staple formation cannot take place. So it will show you instantly a fourth zone. So there is no chance then. Then you the you cartridge will not be spoiled. Yes. Okay. The cartridge will not be spoiled. So that's the beauty of Signia. Signia has three zones, one, two, and three. But if it Signia feels that it will not be able to fire after sensing the tissues and the black cartridge, then it will show you a, a, a red heated a, a, you know map. Uh, that I will not fire. In fact, I will not fire at all. So the cartridge will not be wasted. Uh, can you please elaborate more about reinforced staples? So you have this pericardial tissue on which you put or how is it? The reinforced around So reinforced reload come with uh, polyglycolic acid. Uh, no, you uh, put something white on it and you know that it comes with that. It comes. So the, the material is already preloaded. It's already preloaded. It's already preloaded. What, can you know the price of it? You know, for uh, the reinforced one. The reinforced one so we have a second generation reinforce that is going to get launched with small diameter reloads in next three months. The current price uh, will be just thirty percentage more than the non, uh, uh, you know, the non buttress material reloads. So each stapler costs about thirty forty thousand rupees. Cartridge less than that. Okay. And the uh, anti fog you are telling is it available? Uh, what's it's available. The it's available. What's the price of that? It's just four hundred five hundred rupees. Yeah. Yeah, it's been there long. So, the, so, so the previous generation I drive had lots of buttons. Signa has only one joystick, so left, right, up, and down. It shouldn't. Uh, but we would love, definitely love to. I have already yeah, spoken to Felix yeah, today. Yeah. So we will ensure that you know we you are able to do more evaluations with Signia. Sir. So one more thing, the the curve tip, the curve tip, right? It's only for the vascular, or you have it for the purple load also? It's it's uh, what is the second the, one? The curve tip is it only the vascular, the white loads you have, or the purple tip also has purple loads? Do, do that also have the curve tip? Uh, it's there in purple also, CTMT. The yeah. curve tip. Yeah, yeah, it's there in purple also. The the kick off kick off VAT surgery I think is in uh, firing the stapler, so you don't get that don't get that kick <laughs> with this in energy devices maybe. Okay, but I, so amazing range of products. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, but what is the status of availability of uh, the entire range of products? Like you have issues with soft tissue uh, retractors. So are the other range of products routinely available or? So right now in India. From Signia to Reload to Open Staplers to Clips, Endoclips, Hand Instruments, Fred, everything is available. Okay. 
Okay. Except for doc what Dr. Rajiv uh, so, so was saying, which is the wound protectors. Uh, only that will take two months time. Okay. Otherwise, every product is available, including the radial reloads. The only new product that we are awaiting is a small diameter reload. In your preloaded uh, open uh, uh, staple, uh, yeah. staples, uh, individual clips, do you have any angled one in that or is it only a straight one? Uh, the preloaded so clips one. You're talking about the stapler or the clip applier? Clip applier, preloaded clip applier. So you it's only the straight? It's only the straight. It's only the straight. There is no angle. In fact, I have not seen angle one. Now. In oh, Hemlock, they have the angled one. The Hemlock thing has an angled one. Not this is uh, clips, Liga clips. The Hemlock has an angled one. Okay. Yeah, the shaft is straight yeah. in both. Right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. You. Thank you so much, uh, the, Mr. Lakshay. I'm from, from a financial billing end, so probably I'll also connect with you to understand a few things. Uh, so as we have come to an end of uh, workshop, the two-day workshop on robotic and VATS, I uh, take little privilege to give this token of appreciation. I would invite Dr. Balasan on stage to give the token of appreciation and I request our chairperson Dr. Nageshwar Rao sir to please come onto the dais. Can we have a round of applause? Yeah. Now call Dr. Abhijit Dateshwar sir to come onto the dais. Can we have a round of applause? do healthy. <laughs> and can I call Dr. Rajiv Santosham sir onto the dais please? Thank you everyone. call everyone for a group photo, all the chairpersons of the faculty for a group photo. Time might fly but memories only stay with the click. Yes, please come. Please join us. Mr. Lakshay Basi, please join. A few can come onto the dais so that it will be visible. Thank you. 